Okay. Hey, folks. Uh, let me know if you can hear me so I can make sure my sound is right. I'm going to turn my little light things off because I'm messing up my little light in here. Ow. There we go. All right. Anyway, happy Thursday. Give me a few minutes to let everybody hop on. Um, I know we haven't done a good live in a, a live in a good minute. I think I think the last live was um after the Janet Docs. So yeah, it's it's definitely been a minute. Um give me one second let, let everybody get on. I was still getting my little notes right. That's why there's never enough um hours in a day. But here we are. We're gonna make this work. Um I did want to write that one down. Let me just get a few little last minute notes here because I had a whole bunch of stuff I wrote down for us tonight. Um, let me write that one. Uh huh. Um, All right. Um, okay, good. That's cool. I can do the rest. Perfect. <sighs> All right. How are we? Let me get my little hellos in. Uh, sorry for the hold up. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. What up, Dom? Worthy. Andre. Um, serious. If I miss you, please forgive me. I'm just trying to zip through. What up, um, Sam J? I have a lot of your messages I haven't got a chance to respond to on IG, but I will. So I have not forgot you. I promise. Um, Marilyn V, what up? Uh, Melody Nia, what up, Alan, Dina? Um, we're gonna start in exactly how much time is it? Um, we'll start in exactly two minutes. Um, as far as the content, I'm just giving people a chance to get on real quick. Um, DB, Joanna, James Hudson, Miss Sheba Baby, Abby Wise, 32. KS, Miss Pam. It's funny, Miss Pam. Every time I see you, I, I'm like, I know she's going to say, I'm here, Calvin. I was like, it's kind of interesting. You start recognizing uh, certain people. Um, Antoine Jackson or Antoine Jackson. Uh, D. Bradford, what up? From Oakland. Um, finally made a live. Hey, Calvin. What up, Sylvia P? Simone T. Say, coils popping. They they hurting a little bit today, but it's all right. We'll figure it out. It's been a long day. Um, let's see. Victory begins in the garden. What up, Carrie D. Singleton? What up, sir? I'm gonna reference you in a second anyway. While I'm at it, um, 2008 B. Scott, Tina Walker, New York in the building. Serious goddess. All right, I'm gonna just go ahead and start for the sake of time because I don't want to. We started. Normally, I do these at 9, but I started at 9.15 today, and that is hot, so we're not going to burn our mouth on the live. All right. All right. Anyway, so just as some updates. I know some of y'all were like, you haven't done a video in like two weeks. What the heck, Calvin? And I was like, life is just, I don't know. It's been a really eventful two or three weeks. Um, some of the good things, um, I got a chance to go to New York, I think, two weeks ago. Um, I got a chance. There's a radio show, Carrie's Corner Radio. He's actually in the live now. Um, so I got a chance to go on his radio show in Brooklyn. That was a lot of fun, um, and do an entire, you know, interview. And, and that was about like just music and life and everything like that. Um, I will post the link to the interview cause he did, he was nice enough to upload the full interview on his YouTube channel. Um, he was nice enough to upload it on that. So I will post the link, um, in the description after I get off of this. Um, I'm also featured in, um, Intrigue Magazine, which is also Carrie's Magazine for this month's edition. I'll, post a link to that as well as far as where you can purchase if you're interested. So I got a chance to do that. Um, I took some time. I went down to Richmond to catch up with some friends. And so that was pretty cool. Um, and I feel like you can never go anywhere because now it's, it's YouTube is getting to a point where every now and then somebody recognizes you in public and you're like, hey, what's up? And you don't know if they know you from like 20 years ago or if they know you from YouTube. So you're always trying to figure out, you know, when people first approach you and you're trying to weed and figure out the conversation and then you like realize like, oh, OK, it's from YouTube. Cool. Um, but on a more tragic note, it's it's so crazy because I literally just talked about her in the last um podcast episode. If you if you listen to my eighth grade episode, my step grandma Opal passed away, y'all. Um, she was about to be 89, literally, I think next week. Um, but 
you know, so that kind of slowed down my week a little bit. Um, I'm still trying to figure out um, everything afterwards. She she lives in South Central with my grandfather, but that's kind of tough. But I'm glad I got to go and see them. Remember, I kept telling you guys I wanted to go to L.A. and see my family ASAP because I hadn't had a, I didn't do a lot of traveling once COVID kicked in. But I was fortunate enough to go for Thanksgiving. So I got everything. In. And a good thing is something told me that that might possibly be the last time I saw her. Um, and so something told me to constantly like record our conversations. So it's kind of dope because I have like four, maybe five or six different clips that are all like nine or 10 minutes of us just talking. And she was kind of just, um, you know, sharing tidbits from her childhood because she was actually born and raised in Mississippi and just talking about growing up in like the Delta and making like cro salmon croquet cakes in the morning with her sisters and everything like that by hand, like where they would go out and like catch the fish and order or, or go to the meat man and get the fish and do all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's always dope. You kind of cherish those memories while you have the people around. So I always say appreciate people while they're here. Um, and so I'm going to probably go down at some point later on in the spring just to make sure my grandpa's good. I, I always think it's interesting. Like when people transition, you know, family always swarms in and supports and the friends come and support. And then I think what happens is people forget that once the funeral has come and gone and that those first initial weeks of support have come and gone, then whoever is left with, you know, life you know, to adjust to, um, sometimes they kind of almost forgotten. So I kind of want to show up around that time when everybody's kind of dipped out and it's just him by himself, um, just to make sure he still has like a corner there. Cause I think that's kind of one of the things that happened like with my mom, when my father passed, it was like, everybody was around for like a good month and a half. And then finally everybody had come and gone. And then I think that's when everything kind of hit her. So, um, that's that. I didn't want to try to kill all y'all, but, or not kill y'all, but like kill y'all with sad news. So I'm good. So no worries. Um, and then just, like I said, there was so much going on this week. And then I've been almost literally renovating my entire center. And so I spent the last week and a half building foosball tables and, and couches. Cause you know, we're on a budget. So we was getting stuff from Ikea. And so, you know, we over here and you know, the directions from Ikea are never good. They, they don't get giving you, they just be having like pictures and you got to kind of figure out what is what I'm in here screwing. We didn't have no power drill. So I had to do it by hand and man. So it's been a long week, but I'm here. All right. Um, let's start right with Jesse Smollett since they just were talking about him. Um, so as you know, Jesse Smollett, um, this has kind of been an ongoing story for like two, three years at this point. Um, he had been charged in relation to, they were saying, you know, the false police or false testimony about him being robbed in Chicago at whatever time in freezing cold. And so he has recently been sentenced to 150 days in jail, 30 months probation and a $25,000 fine um my thoughts huh well one i did get a chance to watch the sentencing where he was saying you know you know i'm not suicidal if something happens to me it wasn't me i personally think he is not well um i think he means well but i don't think he is well and i say that because when you kind of just look at the pattern of everything that took place from the moment that the attack happened through the media blitz and the appearances and everything else afterward, things are very interesting in his case. And, you know, I, I think I said this before, like after the Jesse Smollett situation, I told myself I would never be another channel of like, or do like another breaking news piece because I, I remember that story came out. I might've been on YouTube in 10 minutes ready. I'm over here just going off in the, the white supremacist and the system. And I told y'all to th th going in. About a few days later, stuff starts to look a little sketchy and a little murky. Little video footage and stuff coming out. I'm like, damn. Uh, and then around that same time was the situation with, remember little rich white kids that were um, in, in uh, what, what's the name of the school? I can't even think of the name of the school. But they were like at the National Mall and they were kind of, there was the footage of them kind of almost like taunting like the Native American folks. I did a video frying them up too. And that story was a little bit, sketchy too and then there was another story with the girl out here in the dmv where she said the kids cut off her locks at school and told her that she was ugly and i done went in and did this whole dissertation about you know the black image and how our black youth don't even get to be youth and the attacks on black i did all this stuff and i was like you know what i'm over three i said i would never do another like live anything that's why i always like to wait for like the details to really roll out and unfold because i'm not going to continue to be that one because if anything like take take note from um what's his name from uh 
I don't know the guy. I don't, like, what's his name? It's the really messy guy. I don't really care for it, to be honest. Um, the guy that said that the Queen of England was dead. What is that guy's name? Y'all know who I'm talking about from Hollywood Unlocked. You know, couldn't wait to be the first one to give some breaking news. And um, the news was wrong. And then you doubled down on it and wanted everybody to know, oh, no, no, she's dead because my sources said she's dead. And then it turned out your sources were wrong and it was the wrong queen. And then you rent like, nah, Jason Lee, that's his name. But anyway, back to Jesse. Um, no, I don't think he's well. Um, and I think what, what made it so frustrating when it all happened, and I'm not going to really kick him while he's down because, like I said, I don't think he's well. He, that man needs some help. Um, what made it so frustrating is when it took place, it wasn't too far out of the park for something like that to actually take place. Because look at where the country is in regards to race relations. Look at where the country is in regards to the rise of white nationalism and resentment towards different groups of people. And so incidents like that are not a rare occasion, to be honest. However, when things like that take place and they're not from a, a place of like, you know, being actually authentic and it's something that's made up, it serves as a distraction and it slows down any progress that's already being made because now people will always reference the Jesse Smollett situation anytime anything else takes place. You know, it comes into a space where actual victims, and again, I'm not going to take away from his experience, but it's hard to kind of side with him when you got all kind of camera footage and everything else and all this testimony and almost everything contradicts. Oh boy, I'm like, damn, Jesse, like, I don't know what to tell you. I wish you well. But, you know, it slows down any kind of progress because people are going to always use that as an example of why you shouldn't always believe when, when certain things take place or, you know, they'll paint the picture and say, well, this is what we always say. Black folks want to kind of create situations and they're not in, you know, any kind of hardship or there's not any, you know, system that's, you know, disadvantaging black people. They just they just don't want to work. We'll get to you in a second, Kim Kardashian. Um, and so that just, that's just what always made it so challenging. And I think even what sucks um his family, I think it sucks for them because they want to support their family. And so it's like, dang, well, what, what do you do in that situation? And like I said, that specific situation is, is believable to an extent, but the story falls apart. And the footage and the, the, the purchases of the rope and the, all of that doesn't align. And then you're on footage the days before kind of doing like a mock version of it. And just, I'm like, God. Mm. And that's why I said I just don't think he's well. And I think, again, you have some of these people who are child stars and – they end up in this world of entertainment in Hollywood. They get exposed to a whole lot at a young age. Life is not normal for them. I think the idea of notoriety and fame really gets to a lot of folks. And it's, some folks just don't mesh well in that world. I think that world got the best of him. Um, now, he still insists that he didn't do anything wrong. So I can't take that from him. But I'm just saying the, the way that the cards are aligned, it's really hard <laughs> to kind of stand in line and go march for you. But damn. Um, so, you know, we'll see how that unfolds. But now he did say he's not suicidal. So, so if something happens to him, you know, let's keep an eye. So, again, I'm not trying to put anything to the universe, but like, yeah, let's keep an eye on Jesse. Um, but, yeah, I just think moments like that distract from the real issues. And at the same time, let's be honest, Chicago PD needed an outlet for escape because there was enough going on with um, the, was that Laquan McDonald. No, I mix it up the names. Who, who's the one in Chicago? That, well, there's so many they've killed. But the one that they killed in Chicago, is that Laquan McDonald? I don't think that's Laquan McDonald. I think, let me make sure I got the name right. It, it's so bad that there's been so many police killings. We get these, get them wrong. Um, not getting them wrong, but we start forgetting the names. Um, oh, it is Laquan McDonald. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, so um, huh, hot mess. All right, I'm going to pause real quick. I want to just read a few comments, and we're going to just keep it moving. All right? Um, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. If I miss um, some of y'all, please forgive me. I, I just got to keep it moving because we got a lot to cover. Um, Amber Stasher said, I get worried when you're way too long. I'm good. Like if you follow me on the other social media, you know, I'm alive, especially on Twitter. I'd be running my mouth on there all day after like midnight. Um, Instagram, I'm a little bit slower on, um, Poison Ivy said, I'm so annoyed that I missed the book club. YouTube does not give me all the details. Well, to be fair with the book club, I know I announced it the day before, but the, the night of, I don't think I put the notification up until maybe two hours before we were starting. So it probably didn't get to a lot of you guys. So apologies on my end. But the next book club meeting um, is going to be mid-April, and the book we're going to be reading is The Color of Law. Um, I'll go a bit more into detail with that later down the line. Um, let me see. Let me keep it moving. Um, what up, Ms. Williams? Let's see. Alan Lewis said Calvinites. <laughs> All right, Lynn. Oh, Lindsay said that. What up, Lindsay? Or Lindsay, my bad. I think she has a new project out, too, so check her out. L-E- L-E-N-C-I. She's one of our long-term supporters, so let's support her. 
Um, let me keep it moving. Nan Nelson said, why does Jesse Smollett still insist that he's innocent? I so wanted to believe him. Part of me still holds out hope that he might be innocent, but he looks so guilty. It's it it's hard. I think sometimes when you end up in a situation that's already that can almost be embarrassing as well. You sometimes you just ride it out. You take it, ride it till the wheels fall off because you might as well just kind of stay in your lane. I don't know, or stick it out. But man, I, I just think he just he ruined his brand doing that. Like, why? Goodness. Um, goodness. Oh, y'all still give me condolences. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. I'm fine though. No worries for me. Um Ty said, didn't realize this case was still going on. This happened like three years ago, right? Yeah, it, it happened three years ago. The charges initially all had been dropped. Um, then some new people came into power and said, oh, not on, not so fast, and and went back and, and, and reignited the flames, I guess. Um, Don Worthy, Jesse got more time for lying to police than the, ins than the insurrectionists did for fighting. Mm-hmm. Maiming and killing the police. And this is where it gets interesting. This is the point. Yeah, exactly. Because so many have already gotten off in regards to January 6th. Like there's so many who, yeah, like a month, if that, you know, especially the, the woman who was like pretty much bragging that she wasn't going to jail. And then when she did get sentenced, it's only going to be for two, like two months. So she was like, oh, this would be great because, you know, the food is going to be terrible. So I'll be able to lose weight and get the body that I wanted. I was like, see, y'all ain't locking the right people up long enough. <laughs> like, my goodness. Um, but I mean, again, here we go. Um, or even look, you see Kyle Rittenhouse went and shot, killed two people and he got to be, you know, a hero now and he can get days named after him in parades and, and meet the former president and, and be at whole arenas and get a red carpet rollout and pyrotechnics. So it's interesting. Just recognize they will make an example out of you if you don't fit the mold. All right. Um, Alan said, Jesse needs rehab. He has issues, something wrong with him. All right, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna scroll because I'm over Jesse at this point. Um, best wishes. That's true, Andre. I remember that too. Uh, he said Erica Badu said something smelled fishy, and we were ready to drag her. Yeah, Erica did say. I remember her posting like, "Did we look at all the facts?" And everybody ate Erica Badu alive. But I think, um, yeah, I think because of the timing of probably when she said it, because it had just happened. But a lot of folks from jump were like, "Something doesn't add up." I wasn't one of the people. I was right there ready to go and kick some trash cans over but um you know it is what it is um all right i want to move on because i want to drag kim kardashian that's the one i want to go after because that that one there that's the one i've been waiting for i've been letting her slide for a really long time she keep trying it so kim let's get to you so um i know we saw i think this was yesterday there was a clip she recently had done like a magazine article um and there's a clip where she's just talking about work ethic and success. And she goes on this rant about how people just don't want to work. They don't work hard. They need to get up. You know, they don't want to, you know, she's just talking, nobody really puts the work in the time. And she goes on this whole rant about, you know, why people are just, what, why they're not where they should be. And this was supposed to be in correlation with why she's successful and so many other people are not. And for me, it's kind of just like, Kim, please, like, where do we start? Now, Kim alone got four pages out of me. I don't know if I'm going to get through all of them for the sake of my time. But um, let me get my notes here because I, I had a lot I wanted to get off my chest here. Um, the first thing, honestly, is I wish, one, when it comes to celebrities, wealthy people, people who have the means, one, I just wish, one, they would just acknowledge that, you know, because of their upbringing or you know, what was allotted to them or their family, it opened a space for access. Like, I don't think there's a bad thing with acknowledging that. I don't see anything wrong with it. Like, if I was born to the parents of some oil tycoon or, you know, some, but I don't know, somebody invested in crypto in like 20, my mama invested in crypto in like 2010 or something. And now she was like worth, I don't know, freaking $200 million. And then I was able to use some of what she planted for me to go and do great things. I don't see it as a bad thing to say, hey, yeah, I had some extra help. This helped me to get into the door, so on and so forth. And for some reason, a lot of these people who come into public spaces and become famous or very wealthy, they love to paint the story about how hard they worked and how everybody else, you're not there because you suck. And I think that's kind of a very like inauthentic way of presenting yourself. And I think it goes back to the idea that we always punish people for being poor. And so Kim honestly believes that you know she has gotten to where she's gotten because of solely just hard work. 
you know, she has convinced herself that she has calluses on her hand because she's just done so much. If anything, one, she needs to thank her mama. All right. Because I'm just saying I never really watched that reality show they had like that. But the few clips I saw, it was always the mama making the deals and making the calls. That's all I'm saying. But when you look at what it is that she comes from, like the opportunities were already there because she comes from a little bit of money. Her father was this big time lawyer. You know, he was on the O.J. Simpson case. And so the father already had money. The mom had what she had. But by the father and the mother being who they were, it created a space where she had access into different arenas that most average everyday people like myself would not be able to just jump into. It kind of reminds me of like when you saw the clip of Ivanka Trump at the G20 Women's Summit where, you know, this is right after um, former president had got into office. And so, you know, they're at the G20 Summit. There's all these dignitaries and stuff talking. It's like some older women talking about something, having a conversation. And then Ivanka tries to jump in the conversation and both of them look at her and keep talking. Same thing. Like they recognize like, no, you, you don't have the range to be in this conversation because you're only here because of who your father is and what he had. So no, you don't get to jump into this space. And like, that's literally kind of Kim's experience. Like she has to recognize her journey was paved on a moving walkway in escalators. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, she might have done some of the work, but she got to do the work while she was on a moving walkway. You know, like when you're at the airport and they have those moving walkways, like if there's a long terminal, you got to walk through. I don't know. You're in like Atlanta airport. You know, that airport's like the size of Delaware. And, um, you know, they have those moving walkways where you can get on it and walk with your bag and it helps you get there faster. You're still walking, but you're getting some assistance as opposed to if you weren't on the moving walkway and you had to walk it, you know, you're not going to have the same energy by the time you get to the end. And you might not even get there as fast. And you might have to stop and take a break because as soon as you get to the end of where the walkway is, there's another terminal you got to go. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's her experience. And so, and then in addition, in addition, then there's escalators, like same thing with an escalator. It helps you get up the stairs faster as opposed to if you walked. And then again, for you know, imagine if you're a handicapped person and you can't even take, you know, the stairs or the escalator, you got to go and look and find, you know, an elevator and wait in line for one because only three people can fit in it at a time. You know, that's her experience. So like acknowledge that that's your experience. There's nothing wrong with it. But the problem is people want to paint themselves to be like, oh, I, I, I worked so hard. It's kind of like when we start having these conversations about systemic racism and then people who have immigrated here from like a place like Portugal want to come and say, oh, well, you know, my father, you know, did whatever. And they they um worked very hard. They came here with $20 and they came here and worked hard and look where they're at now. It's your fault you went where you're supposed to be. And it's like, yeah, but your father, one, could pass as white. Two, your father came in. There were a whole bunch of programs, you know, created by the federal government to assist your father to be great because your father could pass for white. Your father didn't have to deal with the issues of redlining because your father could pass for white. Your father didn't have to deal with the issues of banking discrimination or housing discrimination or job discrimination or anything else like that. And again, that access to whiteness put you into other into additional doors that were not always open for other groups of people. But again, people like to pick and choose and pretend as if, you know, and, and I hate to be that terrible person, but sometimes when people make that argument, I'm like, OK, well, if you had it so together, why are you over here? Why didn't you go and stay where you at at home? Why you, why didn't you make sure home was good? And that's not to tear down anybody who has immigrated here, but it, it it irks me when people disrespect the plight of those who've already been here and been through the struggle, especially Black Americans. Do not come over here trying to, I was about to cuss, do not come over here and try to tear down the experience of Black Americans because some folks got to jump the line. I, that irks me. Like, that's when I have to catch myself and... And, and, and present my delivery with poison and grace because I, I be trying not to hurt people's feelings, but they keep trying it. But anyway, back to Kim. Um, but again, like just recognize she was in a world where there was access to spaces that average people didn't have. Like she went to prom with TJ Jackson. You know, that's Tito's son. And remember T, Tito Jack, but not Tito, TJ Jackson. He was in that group 3T. They weren't really big in the United States, but they were really big in the UK. You know, they were a boy band. And so she's just had all of this access in, into different spaces that were there. You know what I mean? And so I saw another piece where, you know, she and the other Kardashians were talking about it's it was so hard for us because, you know, doing a reality show, we have to share our lives with the world. And it's a lot of hard work and blah, 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 blah. And I hear that. But, you know, first of all, everybody in their mama has a reality show. So I don't want to hear that excuse. Cause listen, and then really, if I, again, I haven't really seen a lot of the Kardashian show like that, but there's not a lot of hardship on the show. Like if we want to make an example, like if we take up Keisha Cole, who also has had a few reality shows on that show, if we're talking about how hard it was to share life, 
this woman had to share the experience of her mother having an addiction issue and the chaos that existed within her family and not really knowing who her father, like real issues, not issues like, oh my God, I don't know and I'm gonna answer the party and oh, I just lost my whatever piece of jewelry in the water and I'm gonna cry for three, like get out of my face with that nonsense. And so, you know, that's the kind of stuff that irks me. And even when you look at the links, because there's a conversation of access and because there's a conversation of the fact that she already comes from some element of money, look at what doors it continues to open. Because like I said, depending on what it is that you have and where you come from, you can open doors for yourself and then the people that follow suit. So you have the father who's the big time lawyer. He marries the mother. They become a power couple. That gives her a space into access into a bunch of places. So, you know, she gets the prom date. That gets her into a space where now she works for Paris Hilton, who again, this is the daughter of an heir of an entire hotel chain. Now you have all this access to what Paris Hilton has access to. That gets you to Brandy Norwood because you're working for her. We're not going to talk about how you stole some stuff from her, but whatever. That leads you to Ray J. We know what happened. There was a tape, not to be rude, but uh, yeah, I'll shut up on the tape, but they got the tape that happens, right? It creates more fame, notoriety. The money starts coming in and everything else like that. And again, now, again, you have money to build plus the access that was granted to you from your past and, you know, your family lineage, I guess, as far as who your father is, who your mother is, and who your mother remarried to, an Olympic athlete. All right. Caitlyn Jenner. But at the time, it was still Bruce Jenner, like an entire Olympic athlete that was on the Wheaties box and was like an American icon in the 80s and the 90s. And so, again, more access into all kinds of spaces. And so you watch you go from there and then you get the, the, the reality shows and then you bring the family on. And then it's not just Kim, because then you bring in the other sisters. I don't know all their names. And so you have the three that are really popular on the show. And then the other two that come that um the, the, the one that models and then Kylie, who had too much surgery at a really young age and she's going to pay for it when she gets older because if you're going to do plastic surgery on the face you should at least wait till after 26 when your face is a bit more developed but whatever that's not my problem that's hers but again you built an entire brand from nothingness and you're going to sit here and try to act like all of a sudden you've been digging trenches and building foundations to build skyscrapers i don't want to hear it i'm not going to take away from what it is you've been able to create with what was presented to you because you did a good job no disrespect or you know i won't take that away from you but again there's access that has been granted to you and you get to skate on that moving walkway. So like even the idea of the baby bar to be a lawyer, you know, that's some stuff. That's some rich people stuff. Let me go to California and say, I'm going to take the baby bar. They're going to like, if you don't get your black at, like next, you know what I mean? Or even the idea of the fact that she's been able to help a lot of people who have been incarcerated get out of jail. Kim is not the first person to do that kind of work. For the last 40, 50 years, there have been so many grassroots organizations that have fought and clawed to get so many people out of jail. And they sometimes were not successful in doing it because of who they were and what they didn't have. We remember Troy Davis, right? The, the guy, he was executed, I want to say 2011, 2012, where groups fought and clawed to get him out. Didn't happen. The man was, was executed. But now you have somebody like a Kim who, again... Because of who she is, what she can pull, what she can do, there are doors that open. And even though I think it's great that she's able to help these people get out of jail, look how it kind of negates the work that other people have been doing for decades. And how when all of these people get out of jail, or if anybody's in, kind of, in any kind of situation, the first name that comes up out of celebrities is Kim Kardashian. Not these grassroots organizations or these community builders that have been doing the work for years to no avail because they're ignored. And so, again, I don't think it's bad to acknowledge that you had help. Because if you had help, it's cool. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't think I'm rich or I grew up with a spoon in my mouth, but I was blessed to grow up as a child that never had to want for anything. And I think because of that, it helped to open some doors for me to be able to get into certain spaces and also have some perspectives that allow me to see the world differently. It doesn't mean that I'm like, I'm rolling in the door. Life is great. But just that small experience of mine created an outlet for what would be my future. And it, like I said, everybody's experience is different. So I don't know why every time we get into this, people want to paint this picture of I work so hard and people just need to work harder. And she's going to really sit here and act like she's got calluses on her fingers from doing stuff. So. And so, you know, I think what it is, I don't think she likes what it is that she influences. And I say that because I think she probably even got that whole talking point from the fact that there's probably been so many people who got to watch her glide. And, and, and in addition, she's an attractive woman. So that also gets her in the door with looks. And now, you know, we have entire collectives of people who aspire to have a body that she copied from somebody else. You know, you got people going to the plastic surgeon. Can I get the Kardashian special number two combo, please, with a four on the side, right? And so I think what it is, there's so many people who have probably reached out to her and want to get on. And there's not a lot of talent. There's not a lot of skill. There's not a lot of anything. And it annoys her because she feels like, 
you know, you, you got to do some work. You just don't get to come here and do this. Now, she got to do the same thing. But I think when she recognizes that if somebody else wants the same thing, she's going to close that door because she again, she secured her lane. She don't want to give it to nobody else, because, again, I don't see all of this work that she's claiming to do. Now, yes, yeah, she has these businesses and, yeah, OK, you sign some checks or whatever. But there's also a lot of controversy behind a lot of your brand. So, you know, there's all kind of lawsuits from stolen content all the time coming from you and your sisters. All right. All kind of people who have smaller businesses or clothing lines or makeup or whatever else they all got. And they say, hey, I presented this on my website and now the Kardashians got it and they renamed it and they're making all this money from it. Like person after person has constantly came out and said, y'all have stolen their stuff. We've heard about the sweatshops and everything else like that. And even if we want to get to it, like in those earlier years when she was still really trying to build the foundation, she was like a brand ambassador to any and everything as long as it paid a check. So even the idea of integrity behind what it is you got behind, that wasn't even a conversation. And so we even get to the sweatshops and even the horror stories that come from the people that worked with you, where literally, I saw this on Twitter, I wish I would have um, saved it so I could have read it, but th there was a woman talking about the fact that I literally worked for you and I was doing my own side hustles at the same time and I was reprimanded. Um, because you only want to be, you know, working for the Kardashian type stuff. So when people wanted to work and get off their behinds and do whatever else, you know, they needed to do, they got reprimanded. Why? Because it's slowing down the process. And from what I understand, she has a very small team for all that she's trying to do. So all them people over there are burned out. But enjoy. Uh, and I think the problem with this argument, because this is kind of, I've done this video before, so I'm not going to go into a million details, but we kind of did this with Steve Harvey as well, right? Remember Steve Harvey was saying, you know, if you're on the West Coast, why are you still sleeping until 8 o'clock? You know, the, the East Coast has already been up for three hours. They already in the stock market deciding stuff for you. And I wanted to be like, well, one, if we're talking stock market, most of the average everyday people don't even have any real stock anyway. If we're not talking 401k, I'm talking money, money in the stock, like, you know, six figures in the stock market. And it's not the retirement fund. It's exposable money that they or disposable money that they don't need. That's not really the case. Hold on one sec. Um, uh, but anyway, going back to Steve, you know, he did this whole rant about, you know, people got You got to get up early and you got to work and you should be up at five in the morning. What you doing sleeping for and blah, 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 blah. And I think people keep forgetting that a lot of times people who make it into these very extreme positions of success, because somebody like a Steve Harvey, a Kim Kardashian, most of the celebrities that we, we people like to celebrate and follow. These are exceptions to the rule. These are unique circumstances where a lot of time people got on because of luck and opportunity and being in the right place at the right time. And they were ready when the opportunity came. It wasn't because they worked the hardest, because honestly, most of the hardest working people in this country are the forgotten people. These are the people that we ignore. Well, not we, but society ignores. These are the people that like, let's talk January 6th again, right? That all these cuckoo lunatics in there tearing up the Capitol. And one thing they did not really share in the media, like they tore that place up. I mean, folks were pooping on the floor, pissing on the wall, blood, snot, everything. Who had to clean all that up? The custodial staff. And what is the majority of those people like when we're talking demographics, where do they come from? These were D.C., Maryland, Virginia residents that were older black people, younger black people, some people in the Latino community. Those people had to go and clean all of that up. You know, those are the hard workers. Those are the people that are ignored. We didn't get to paint and, and push them around and be seen as the heroes. They don't get to be celebrated. And that's one of the, the issues I have every time people look at D.C. as just politician and lawyer town. They forget that this is a real city with real people that have their own livelihoods. And so when people come here to wreck havoc because they're pissed off with whatever's happening politically, you know, they, they forget that the people who work the hardest are the ones who end up suffering to with whatever's happening. And so, you know. When it comes to these conversations of just, oh, people don't want to work. No, Kim, the people that you're frustrated with are the people you've influenced with your brand of nothingness. And now you're mad because there's a bunch of Kim Kardashians running around that want exactly what you created. And you're mad because you don't want to give it up. You want it just for yourself. And so that's what that's about. Because, again, we, we could spend all day talking about the systemic issues that create environments where you have people that are always going to be poor and some people who will always be rich. We could do that because I even think that. And I told this story on one of my podcast episodes. It was one of the Howard University episodes, but there was a summer session where, um, because I changed my major so late in my, I changed my major going into my junior year. And then I also played around freshman year and I had to pay for it. I did a summer session. And the problem was I had class from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Now I had a 
two hour break in between all five classes. And the problem was my dorm was not on campus. It was like nine blocks away because I stayed in Meridian and DC in the summer is hot, hot. And so, you know, sometimes I'll go to class, walk back to the dorm, walk back to class, walk back to the dorm. And so, you, you know, you, you're doing this go back thing like four or five times a day. And then at the same time, I was a conference assistant in the dorm. And so I had a night shift from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. And I did this Monday through Friday for like a month and a half. 12 hour class day, eight hour work shift, about two and a half hours of sleep. And somewhere in the middle, I'm going to squeeze in breakfast and dinner. I was in the hospital in a month, a month and a half later, I was in the hospital, burned myself out. And this was not even physical hard labor. This was literally just walking, going to class, studying, sitting and monitoring, monitoring the lobby. And it still almost took me out. So imagine the people that have to do, especially like when we go into Generation X, the baby boomers. Um, and even people in, in these modern times that have jobs that are very physically demanding, that are doing stock, you know, stock or working the trucks or unloading and all that stuff. And they do all this physical labor for years and years and years and years and years. The wear and tear that exists on the body. Like these are people that are doing the real work. And the part that sucks is they get paid nothing. And society can't operate without these people. And it's interesting because the people that we elect continue to strip away and chip away everything that would benefit a demographic like those who do that kind of work. And so when people start going and ranting about, you know, who's working hard, I don't want to hear it, especially from any politicians. All of them can shut up because they all full of it. Um, and so, again, just recognizing like, you know, that cushion that you have because of what your parents had to begin with and what you came into or that seed money, it opens doors and there's nothing wrong with it. Just acknowledge it. Do not go back and try to, you know, tear down the people who didn't have what you had. And then you want to tell them it's their fault. They don't have what you have. That's not how this works. And we recognize that the system, at least in the United States, is set up to keep people stuck either on one end, end where they're extremely wealthy or the other end where they're always going to be poor. The fact that we're in a country where 61 percent of bankruptcies come from medical issues because health care is too high. All right. And we could get, you know, into the conversation of welfare or housing assistance programs or what happens with jail or and everything else like that in regards to how people end up in predicaments where it's hard to get out. Like we know with welfare, there's all kind of rules where it's almost set up where you start working, you're going to get kicked out of the program. It, some kind of public housing setups, depending on how it is, you got to stay under a certain threshold. Only one adult can be on the lease. Once you start having too many people on the lease, you're going to be kicked out of the program. Depending on what kind of programs you're in, if there's a threshold with how much you can make, I don't know, you can only make 45000 a year. You know, the minute you get a better job that, I don't know, it promotes you and, and you can make 50000 a year, unfortunately, it's going to kick you out of whatever program you're in. And now you're worse off than when you started, even though you went and bettered yourself and got a better job, you now make too much. You're kicked out of whatever program it is that is helping you. This happens to a lot of families that have children that are special needs um, or that are in any kind of specific situation where there's money coming in from a state where certain groups of people are only allowed a certain amount of income to come in. And the minute they go over that threshold, it's not even that the systems let the people ease out and transition into the, the economy without assistance. It's literally, oh, you made this much, you're cut from the program. Good luck. That's life for people. So I think a lot of times these entertainers are, are out of touch with reality. They don't live in the worlds that we live in. And again, because they carry influence, they, they think that they're in a position to try to tell you how to do things. I can understand giving words of encouragement, but once you start trying to tear people down, you know, that's where I, I look at you sideways. Or if you want to do the rant about do the work, tell people what to do. What, what, what should they do, Kim? I mean, do I need to make a tape? I'm sure people are watching. <laughs> but, um, you know, like... I, that's the thing. People will be gatekeepers to the wealth and then to, you know, tear you down for being poor. But them Kardashians, I don't deal with. Plus, that's why I get frustrated at all these men that keep marrying and dating them and they come out even worse off than they started. Like something is wrong with that family. I'm sorry. I can't. I already got my issue with the stuff Kanye be doing. But some of that, I look at them Kardashians like even I didn't even plan on talking about Kanye, but even with the Kanye situation and Kim saying, OK, well, and this is not to take up for his nonsense either, but. You know, the whole thing about, oh, well, he's putting all of our issues in our business on social media. And then I sit here and read that half of the issues that Kim and Kanye have been having in regards to their marriage is going to be on a new season of whatever show they have on Hulu. You know, like y'all playing games. Y'all are playing games like I, I'm not doing this with y'all. Not tonight. No, no, I'm not the one. All right. I'm going to pause and read some comments because I ranted for like a good 20 minutes and did not breathe. Hmm. All right. Let's see. There's a lot, so I'm not going to be able to get to all of this. Um, thank you, Poison Ivy. When will people realize that shutting up is free? Like, if you're going to speak, just make sure you know what you're talking about. 
I try not to always have an opinion on everything because I don't always get it right. So if it's not I, I'm not well versed, then I'll shut up about it. But dang, some folks want to have a speech on everything. Um, man, let's see. 2008, B. Scott said, yeah, let's talk about the government money. Um, <laughs> oh, OK, that was in regards to the, the Portugal person. Exactly. People like I don't think people really dig into the history of how much the federal government has assisted specific groups of people that don't include black people. <laughs> like uh, and we've talked about it before, but like the GI Bill, black folks were left out of it. That created a space where so many people were able to get those FHA loans. And, and that's another separate conversation. But I'll stick just to the GI Bill. The GI Bill in regards to the money for education, like think of how many generations that would set up where the government is helping you go to school, you know, literally for free. And look at where we're at now where college is like six figures to go to after four years. So you had entire generations of people be left out. They've gone to World War One, World War Two, been shot in the back and lost limbs and got all the same issues that everybody else got in the military and came back to this country all broke up and they got none of the benefits. All right. What does that do? What does that say? How does that affect generational wealth? We talk about the FHA, the Federal Housing Authority, um, and, and, and who was allowed to live and own property where. You know, and when we really talk about property, recognize that up until about the 1940s, houses had depreciation. You know, it, it, there wasn't the, the idea of thinking that, you know, when you buy a house in 1940, it's going to be worth a whole lot of money in 1960. At the point in time, before we really got into redlining, especially before 1910, the idea of purchasing a house was once you purchased the house, it wasn't going to be worth anything because the houses in this country are already built very cheaply. We've talked about that before, but when, when you compare the way homes in the United States are built to a place like Europe, because Europe uses cobblestones or cobblestone and other material that's a bit more sturdier, people in Europe don't have to spend as much time renovating and facelifting and flipping their homes every 20, 30 years like Americans do because our homes are wooden. All right. And, you know, all of the rain and the earthquakes and the storms and the floods and everything like that, we constantly have to go in and give our homes a facelift every 20 or 30 years. But anyway, um, again, when you talk about the idea of depreciation, the idea of appreciation in regard or, or, or the building of wealth within property didn't become a thing until after redlining. Once you created these neighborhoods that were in specific areas where there was access to resources, access to recreation, shopping, roads that got you to wherever, good schools, good health care, good everything. And now because of where your house is located, now it's going to appreciate in value, you know, become a bit more than, than what it's been before because of the location it is. And now we fast forward into the 21st century and we jump into gentrification. And this is why now you have people like literally going and going into almost the areas that were deemed undesirable, you know, decades ago. And now this is prime real estate because, okay, well, if enough of us come up in here, the property values are going to go up. Even if we don't do anything to the property, just because of who we are, we can move into these areas. The property values are going to go up. And so this is why now you can go to a lot of cities and even the homes in the hood are too expensive. All right. And so now people that live in the hood are getting pushed out because they're getting taxed out. OK. And then again, when we talk about the conversations with education, so on and so forth, you know, there have been so many systems in place that, you know, benefit some, disadvantage others. So it's like if you're going to have these conversations, celebrities, about why people are poor, can we have the full conversation, not the end result and not what you just think because you live in your bubble of wealth? I ain't trying to hear it. Um, I'll get to them in a sec. All right. Um. I keep seeing somebody said you've been listening to Tariq. I don't really follow Tariq Nasheed. Um, I used to follow some of the stuff he said years ago. I mean, I recognize what he does, but like I said, I'm not a part of any groups. It's just me, myself, and I over here. I, I will hear the platforms and viewpoints from a lot of the different groups, but I just don't want to be tied to anybody. So I kind of just mind my business, and it's the Calvin Show over here. Um, but no, a lot of this conversation is just, y'all didn't see we read a lot. So a lot of this is just coming from the books. <laughs> um, Anyway, um, hopeful bond said nobody asked for the reality show, but that, that's true. Nobody really asked for it. people ended up watching it because I guess it was entertaining. But you know, it is what it is. Um, and again, yeah, exactly. If you're gonna say the idea of oh, it was so hard for us to do this show, well, then don't do it. Y'all already have enough money where you don't have to do it, so save it, please. There's other people who have to do things that they have no choice in, or they're not gonna eat. Um. Let's keep it moving. Felicia Adams, let's not forget that she stole from Brandy. And I, it's funny that nobody remembers that. Like you stole from, a, and I think we were, we were like $150,000 or something like that. There was a whole lawsuit. I think Brandy's mom had to sue about that. Like folks be playing these games. We be thinking folks stupid. Um, all right, we're about to keep it moving. 
I haven't said enough on these Kardashians. They just irk me for some reason. Like, again, I don't mind people getting famous for whatever, but if you get there, be grateful that you're there. Don't start trying to kick down the other people that are trying to get to wherever they're trying to be. All right. Somebody said Gen Z needs to chill on the plastic surgery. I, I think the, the challenge, though, sadly, for that collective is that, and I, I only speak on what I know from the teens that I work with, and well, some of them are now young adults. You know, they really are the first demographic that would grow up solely in an era of social media. Some of the, the older Gen Z ones might kind of remember a time where all of this stuff really wasn't out there. But like millennials, we are really that last generation of people that, especially like if you're like in my age bracket, like there's like a four or five year window where we're really that last, like social media really didn't become a thing until I, maybe my senior year of high school, you know, YouTube came out in 05. That was my senior year. Uh, MySpace was kind of out and, you know, starting to get its legs. Um, Facebook was only for college students. Instagram was not a thing. Snapchat was not a thing. TikTok was not a thing, you know. Um, and so social media was there, but it didn't carry the influence and the weight that it does now. And so like fast forwarding to a lot of those in Gen Z, especially the really young ones, um, you know, it's almost in a space where social media, it, it's a, it's a piece of their existence. Like in the same way I have YouTube and like, if I, you know, I don't know, disappear for a month and a half, y'all are going to assume that I'm dead or something. Um, uh, you know, for them, it's a, it's almost their go-to it's their reflex. And the same way that a lot of us wake up and the first thing we do is grab our phones, same thing for them. So imagine where you constantly see all these images of what is deemed perfection. Because the other thing, a lot of these celebrities lie about not having plastic surgery. Plastic surgery has gotten so advanced where you don't even have to go under the knife anymore. There's all kind of, you know, procedures that, you know, they go, they call it with the lunch break procedures. You go and do something real quick and be in and out. Like it's nothing and all kind of injections and all this other stuff you can do um, without having to do like the throwback surgeries they used to have to do back in the eighties and the nineties where you came out of the doctor's office and you had a whole new face. Um, but again, I think we're in a space where for a lot of people, you constantly see, you're constantly bombarded with what's deemed as perfection and people strive to do it. Like even look at the difference with even like pictures. There's all these different apps where you can kind of manipulate and change your pictures. I know like sometimes I, I have acne, y'all know that's no secret, but every now and then it can be really bad. And so, you know, if I got, if I think I look good in that picture, but the acne, like, like right now I got a spot right here that I'm waiting to go away. Like, you know, I might polish that up a bit so it doesn't look bad. And that was some freaking... The flaw with having curly hair is it happens, your facial hair is curly too. So imagine your hair is trying to grow out of your face, but it curls under the skin instead. Totally sucks. I'm always going to suffer from ingrown hairs, but whatever. Um, so, you know, that's that, but let's keep it moving. Um, let's keep it moving. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. Sorry if I'm skipping your comments, y'all. I just want to, I got so much I want to still cover. Um, T. Kelly said, try to take the name Kimono. First of all, let me, and the other thing they killed me with, with was all the attempts to trademark everything. When, what was it, the sister, um, what's that girl's name? Kylie. When Kylie tried to trademark the name Kylie, and I'm like, how do you trademark something that's common? Like, it's a common name, and you aren't the only Kylie that people know. Like, people would, would know Kylie Minogue if you live in Australia or the UK. Like, you don't just get, um, even the US, I guess, you don't get to just show up and try to trademark simple things. Or remember, there was like a clip when she had the baby, and I think she just said, Rise and Shine. And it, I think, I don't know if this is true or not. This might just be me running my mouth, but I think they were trying to trademark Rise and Shine. Like, they just want to trademark everything and put a, a stamp on it so they can get a check. That's not work to me. That's just understanding the system you live in and making it work for you. Um, goodness. Poison Ivy says she wouldn't be modeling if it were not for her family name. Like, listen, what's that Tyra? Remember the Tyra show with the models? All the stuff Tyra had them girls going through, and then none of them even win. You know, the girls would go, and they, I've been growing my hair out for, for 12 years since I was a teenager, and Tyra make them cut it all off, and then they go home the next day. And Tyra had the girls hanging upside down and they got to lay in a bed with spiders and they got to, you know, jump out of exploding helicopters and, and somehow still model. Like they have some real boot camp there. And mind you, the, the, the one that's the model just got the, you know, hey, I'm a model. Like I got in the door. I'm not going to take away from whatever she does. I don't really follow her. I wouldn't know what her model experience is. But like, again, access to opportunity and spaces because of who you are and where you come from. And again, for me, there's nothing wrong with it. Not just for me, just acknowledge it. Recognize that. 
there are a set of benefits and privileges that were given to you that allowed you to get into the spaces that you were in. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem that comes with that is when you deny the fact that that's the real case. And then you want to sit here and blame other people for their predicaments. And that's one of the flaws I have or the beefs that I have with a lot of politicians, because we have a lot of people in power who already came from money, who came from wealth. And because they cannot relate to the average everyday person, they have no problem pushing out punitive legislation, legislation that strips away. Like think about when Reagan got in office and one of the first things he did was cut, you know, uh, the, the school funding in regards to meals for kids. You know what I mean? Um, you know, where, where literally, I, God, what's the figure? I want to make sure this is right. I wrote it in my phone the other day. And I think, the um, what's the girl? There's a YouTube channel. I think it's Lectual Media. She has a really good channel. So I, could just, I think she talked about this too. But I think it was saying at that time when he got in there, if you made more than $11,000 a year, you weren't eligible for free lunch once Reagan got in there and changed the rules with who could get free lunch. Like this is the reality of what is. And, and I think we talked about that too when we talked about the Reagan documentary. I don't remember what in the news, but when you saw all of the programs that he was snipping and, and sniping and cutting away from, because again, he couldn't relate to the average everyday person. He was wealthy, you know, and you know, the stories have come out about Nancy in the past, if you know what I'm talking about. So like they, they had totally different life. So man, anyway. Official BNA Music 88. Judge Steve Harvey, LOL. Yeah, now the man got a judge show. Ain't been in no kind of schooling, but he got a judge show. I mean, it's entertainment, but yeah, that's the point we're making here. Um, Sweet Angel said because they're selling their souls. Maybe that too. Um, <laughs> Javonna D said, yep, flying in private planes to tear stuff up. And again, this is not even to tear down wealthy people and celebrities, but it's just, if you're going to be rich and, and, and famous, be rich and famous and enjoy it and, and shut up. Like, leave the rest of us alone. You know, whatever we choose to support, we'll support, but you're not about to come after me. Not after I spent all week building a, a freaking foosball table and a couch <laughs> and, and an arcade game. I built a, I built a whole Pac-Man arcade machine. Man, the instructions was all backwards. Anyway, um... Um, Khalil, or uh, I think that's Calypso once said, Kim Staff sued her for not getting breaks and being underpaid. Mm hmm. Stephanie from Wine and Chill was just talking about it. See what I'm talking about? See, they and then they don't ever talk about their shady practices. Um, hot mess. They, uh, Dasha Noble said, Darn, Calvin, um, when did you get your schoolwork done? That's in regards to my conversation about that, that, that summer session. I because I had a two hour break in between each class, that's when I would try to get everything done. And then I would try to squeeze in a lunch somewhere in the middle. And then, you know, if I, and every now and then you'd have a nice professor, maybe the class would end early or something. So you had some extra time. Um, and so sometimes I would like get on the train and go to another side of town and like grab some food, food and eat at a restaurant. But then that's when somebody tried to rob me in DuPont Circle one time. I think I told this story. It was the weirdest day. Um, it was summer right? It's probably 90, 100 degrees. And I used to walk on my iPod once it was daylight and I was on the right side of town where I knew I wasn't going to get snatched up. And so I used to walk on my little iPod and I used to always walk to the pace of the music because I was always a fast walker. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I just, I remember I just finished eating. I went to, um, I think I went to Daily Grill in uh, Far Far Farragut North. And I was trying to get to the train because I knew I had my business law class I had to get to. And so I'm rushing to try to get to the train or whatever. And I start noticing like there's somebody that I think is like behind me or following me. And mind you, this is broad daylight. It's like two o'clock in the afternoon in July or June or something like that. So I'm walking, I keep realizing somebody's behind me. I'm like, I'll keep, I'll keep walking. I finally get to like um, an intersection and you know, the cars are shoom, shoom, shoom. So I got to wait. And so some guy like taps my shoulder. I'm like, huh? What? And he's like, I need you to turn your music down. I'm like, what? What's the problem? And he's like, oh, you got to give me everything in your wallet. I was like, <laughs> all right, something ain't right with this one. Because you know, like, it, it clicked to me that, okay, he's not all together up there. Because I'm like, if you think you about to rob me in front of all these white people out here walking dogs in broad daylight. And first of all, like the fact that you have followed me for like four blocks and you're sweating harder than I am. If you think I'm about to give you my wallet, I was like, I'm sorry. We just got to do this another time. I'm late for class. And I literally just walked off. Like I told him like, sorry, I can't do it right now. I'm late for class. I got to go do it to somebody else. Like, and he just let me go. But I, I don't think he was together. Um, and that was an interesting day. I was like, what the heck? That was a summer there. That was like, that, that podcast is on, is up there somewhere. That was a time there. Man. Anyway. Kim Bronson said the January 6th insurrectionists, uh, January 6th insurrectionists didn't get 
that much time, nor do the police that shoot on armed black people. Yeah, we that's it's almost routine at this point. It's just expect we get excited when somebody actually gets convicted for killing somebody unarmed. All right. We just saw like we knew, like even in regards to the Breonna Taylor situation, we knew that that officer already wasn't going to jail. They had only been charged with wanton endangerment. So the one charge that was given to a police officer in the death it related to Breonna Taylor was even about Breonna Taylor being murdered, but it was more so in regards to the fact that you shot a gun into a wall and you endangered the people in the other unit. So never mind the woman y'all actually killed. That's fine. But, you know, it is what it is. Then that officer still want to get on the stand and start crying. You know, the judge and all of them just let them off. Whatever. I don't care. I care, but I don't care. Um, Ollie Perry says, slow down, man. I know, but when I get in my pocket, I got to get it all out while it's fresh. Like, it's like I'm talking and the thoughts keep coming. I'm like, it's like a, a, a machine, assembly line. All right. Anyway. Um, boom. All right. I'm going to keep it going. I'm going to keep it going. All right. We're almost to the bottom of the comments. Good. <laughs> B-Law, I hear that class is hard like every dog on business program. That one just, well, the re it was hard for me the first time because I was coming, I was a communications major. So business law was like, it was another planet for us. So, you know, I was so used to having to always do speeches and group presentations and 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 other things. And so like B-Law was literally, you get a case and you got to solve it. We hadn't had any law practice, or, you know, exposure. So we're like, huh? <laughs> that class used to kick everybody's behind. I think everybody had to take that class twice. Minus the, those who were already in the, the business school at Howard, but I was in the communication school. So, um, all right, I'm gonna keep it moving, y'all. Huh. All right, we said a lot. Ryan Coogler, so much going on. Like this has been an eventful little week. Um, so as we know, like the story come out, ha has come out. Now this took place, I believe, in January. But Ryan Coogler, the footage has come out, but. There was a point in time where he had been detained by police while he was trying to withdraw money out of his bank account. Um, when we talk about the details, he shows up to the bank, has on his shades, his little scully and his mask because it's still a pandemic out here. I don't care. I, I'm not going to spend all day talking COVID, but I'm just saying it's interesting how politics play a role in what happens with the CDC and what rules are put out there. Folks are playing games. So y'all just be safe and use discernment, please. But anyway, you know, he comes, you know, he has on his shades and his scully and his mask and he gives the deposit slip. Um, and there's also a note on a slip saying, OK, you know what he specifically wanted. And he also gives the bank teller his ID and, you know, the pin for the account. And the teller can see all of the info in the account. And apparently because he was trying to withdraw twelve thousand, there's a specific flag. Now, he wasn't doing a whole lot of talking. He just kept telling the teller to, you know, just look at the note, look at the note. The teller goes to the management because she says something is a little bit off. Um, I. It gets a little sketchy here, but at some point the police are called and she's on the phone with the police. If you've heard the tape, she's saying, yeah, you know, there's an individual, this, that, and third. She says, you know, he's not armed I, or I don't believe he's armed. Um, but this is where it gets tricky because she technically did not look at the man's ID to verify that that was the person that, you know, they said they were. She went ahead and just called the police right off the jump. And so before you know it, the police arrived and they have the guns aimed at Ryan Coogler, who's just trying to, you know, get his money out the bank. And, you know, so he's patiently waiting because they keep telling him, oh, we'll be out in a second. We'll be out in a second, just a second. And so, you know, now the footage has come out. The story's come out. It's a big hoopla. Um, at first, when I was reading the details, I was trying to look at it like, okay, well, this is kind of a unique situation and multiple things can be true at once. But the minute I heard the call and the woman specifically said that she didn't look at the ID, right there is kind of where you lose credibility. Because I was trying to vouch for her. I really was. Because I didn't like that people try to turn this into like a gender war with black men versus black women. We're not doing that. Not on this channel. That's, no, we're not doing it. Um, but anyway, um, so I was trying to like, I was trying to piece together all the possible outcomes, but it's like once you choose to not look at the like, you should have looked at the ID. You know what I mean? And some people were saying, "Oh, well, that's so weird. What you call? Why didn't he just go and tell them what he wanted?" And blah 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 blah. And I think he kind of says that in the police video where he's like, "Listen, I live in an area where you know people get robbed all the time. I'm not going to go in here and say, hey, can I take out twelve thousand dollars in twenties, tens, and in fives? You know, and, and in addition, I said this a few videos ago, but he also, remember, he does have like 
a unique way, a, a unique way of delivering his speech. I don't know if it's a full speech impediment, but he's always been very insecure about that as well, which is why you don't see him do a lot of interviews or a lot of public speaking. And so I think maybe he may have even been really aware of the fact that, you know, if he's constantly going into these banks asking for these large sums of money, there's a possibility that people may look at him to be something that he is not once he opens his mouth. I don't know if that's how he saw things, but, you know, it, it's bad for me when, when you just assume the worst, when in reality, this is this man's actual bank account. He gave you the pen. He, he had a full ID. He had a deposit slip. And, you know, it's just like you just needed to look at the ID to verify. You know, had she just looked at the ID and, and verified, I don't think we would have gotten this far in it. And I understand people saying, well, she was afraid. She was fearful. And I think, you know, again, people work in banks. Things happen all the time. But Ryan Coogler is also not the first person to come to the bank with a note. And I'm not talking about, you know, a note that's not a robbery note. Like there's a lot of people who come in with notes. And then you also think about people who are hard of hearing or deaf, who often come in and have to write everything down because not every teller is going to be able to speak American Sign Language. And so, you know, I think, you know, it's interesting that so many people initially, when the story first came out, tried to fry him up and was like, why would you go and write? No, why would you do it this way? Like just, like, mm, all right. You know, I just think Bank of America, first of all, <laughs> is a trash bank. I just want y'all to know that I, I pulled my money out of there so fast. The minute they were talking about, you know, you had, I think they're taking $12 out a month just to even have the account. Cause I had, I still use key bank. Like that's my favorite bank. They've always been good to me. I've had no problems with them. I've had them since I was like 14 years old. Um, but when I moved here, there's no key bank in the DMV. And so I got a bank of America account. So like anytime somebody, ever, and this is before you could, um, you know, scan a picture and deposit stuff. This, this one, you still had to go, sign a check and take it to the bank and stuff. So anytime there was a check or something that came to me, it would go in the Bank of America account. So that was an account that never really had a lot of money in it. So I don't know if, if a family member sent me a check for $100 for Christmas or something, you know, I put it in that Bank of America account and I would try to build on it. And then I come back to the account in three months and it's like a whole $36 was taken out. I'm like, what the heck? And so yeah, Bank of America, I'm good on. But, um, oh, they are. Mm. It was even like, I remember they were building this building by my job and we all thought it was going to be a restaurant. I was like, oh, we about to be eating lunch. And we, about, we about to be eating lunch and stuff. It was a freaking Bank of America. I'm like, there's one up the block. Y'all, how many of y'all need? We all still going to be the same level of broke. <laughs> like, dang. But um, I don't know if that bank teller was new because I, I wonder what the, the training was. Um, I don't know, it, but it's it, what it is. And then, again, people were trying to go in about what he was wearing. That just seems like regular clothes people wear. Like, y'all know, like, uh, as a person with hair, if this crap, was, it ain't really looking that great tonight. But if it's like, uh, like when I wake up, it's mashed in on the sides and on the back. And if I want to run a Dunkin' Donuts or something real quick, I put that hat on and mask and them shades and be out. I look exactly the same. So it's like, that's normal attire for a lot of people. Um, so I don't know why that became a thing. I hate that TMZ, of course, would get the story. You know, they can't wait to put everything out. Um, but I'm just glad that it did not end up the way it could have ended up. You know what I mean? Because again, recognize not everybody responds well to a gun randomly being pointed at them. It's a good thing that he's, you know, here because, you know, what if he had a condition or something and, 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 and spazzed out and then next thing you know, he's a hashtag, you know, because that's the reality. Um, and so I'm just glad it didn't go in the way that it could have gone. But it's just like, man, come on. Come on. Folks got to do better. All right. Let me read some comments here. Man. When am I going to run for elected office? I ain't running for no office. Look at how um, crooked politicians we got now. I have to fight all of them on site. Um, let me see. Um, D. Jordan, I did cover Jesse. That was the very um, first story we did. But the good thing is once this um, is once we're done here, it automatically uploads, uploads to the channel. Uh, Jay said, bro, I can't fit a robbery to my schedule today, next week. Like, real, like y'all don't understand. At that point in time, when I was a student, I, so I, I, I've said this before. I did college all wrong. People always are like, oh my God, Calvin, you're so smart. I'm like, yeah, because I struggled a lot. And so life kicked me in the behind. I had to learn the whole hard way. Like I, I said, I always say like, I came out of Howard real stupid. Like I learned a whole lot, but I was still real stupid because life, I hadn't lived yet. But anyway, um, when I got to Howard, I played around freshman year because I, I worked so hard in high school because, you know, work hard, work hard, work hard, burn myself out in high school that when I got to Howard, I was in relaxed mode for freshman year and I did not do good. Like freshman year, I had a two five the first semester and then a two two the next semester. I was getting cussed out in every language by my mama about that. And then sophomore year, I 
did a whole lot better. I had like a three eight. Um, junior year was really good too. I had like a three six, I think, or three seven. But um, I changed my major. And then freshman year, I, I was doing this all wrong. I didn't even go to the orientation properly, and I didn't know that Howard had a scheme of classes you specifically take. And so I was just taking classes at the time because when I came in, I was a political science major. So I was just taking all the classes that were poli sci. Fortunately for me, that worked in my favor because I at least was taking some of the prerequisite classes. But I could have easily taken the wrong classes and, and been behind two semesters. Um, so yeah, I had to do a summer session and that summer session, it, it was, that was a hustle because that business law class was so hard. Um, and so I was burning myself out that time. So I, sorry, you got to rob somebody else. I got a lot going on. I ain't got the money anyway. I'm a college student. So like, psh, I might've, and I, didn't, I don't carry cash either. Like I've never been one to carry cash. So they, he wasn't going to get anything out of my wallet except, um, what's in there? Probably gum maybe some protection type stuff, but like nothing else would have been in my wallet at the time. So I don't know what he thought he was going to get because I always just carry a card. And even now I don't carry cash, especially working with kids because they always want to ask you for a dollar when an ice cream truck pull up in the neighborhood. So no, nah, you got to come back another day. So the minute I realized something wasn't right with old dude, I'm like, no, nah, you ain't robbing me out of here. Especially I'm watching people walk dogs and throw Frisbees and stuff. I was like, yeah, you ain't about to rob me out here. You better pick one of these other people. Absolutely not. Now, had that have been, you know, nine... 10, 11 o'clock at night, and I was on a different street in a different place. Okay, help, here you go. Take the whole thing because I don't want to, you know, take it all. But uh, it is what it is. All right. Let's keep it moving. Um, yeah, somebody, who just, that was a good comment. Oh, I just lost it though. Dang it. it the, the, my thing just jumped. Crap. Whatever it was, it was real great that you said what you said, if I could find it again. Um, let's see. I mean, every woman said a black man with money. That too, the idea. Oh, I don't believe you can have what it is that you have. Okay, it's kind of like remember when um, who's the is that Henry Louis Gates? Yep, Henry Louis Gates. Um, you sometimes you see a lot of his documentaries on like PBS. He has like the um African Americans Many Rivers to Cross, which is a really really great docu series. You should watch all six. I think it's six episodes. They're so good. That literally tells the story of Black America from from you know, slavery on, well, even before slavery, but, you know, from the moment that sh the ships come to where we are now, it's a really, really good series. But remember the time where he was, I think he was going to his neighborhood and the security officer or the police officer didn't believe he lived where he lived. And then he got arrested. Um, and then it was a whole thing. And then Barack Obama got on my nerves with that because then he wanted to have Henry Louis Gates and that officer sit down and have a beer. And I'm like, Barack, I understand you want to be everybody's friend. And I get it. We're trying to become this American melting pot, but we have to sometimes just address that racism is racism. And, you know, that, that irked my nerves. And then the worst part is the cop left feeling exactly the same way. He would not budge with his viewpoints. And I'm like, see, y'all be trying to extend all the branches to the wrong people. Sometimes when a system is so, you know, well oiled and everything like that, the end result is never going to change because you got to go back and change the origins. All right. Refix the gears in that machine to change it, but whatever. Um, let's see. Um, when love, when love said she couldn't have even looked at his account. That was the thing that threw me off. I'm like, you know, nobody's gonna rob a bank if they've given you their ID. <laughs> oh, that's all the identification. All of us in scene set it off. We've all learned what not to do if you ever decide to rob a bank. Like, what? All right, I'm gonna keep moving. Oh, that's a good line there, Butterfly Knife. Black people practice anti-blackness against black folks all the time. Because that's another, I think, what was I? Oh, that was on a book club we were talking about that, where sometimes even when we're talking about anti-blackness, there's this assumption that it's only coming from white America. And in reality, it can come, it can come in all kinds of forms and spaces. Um, and like I said, I don't know the Bank Teller's full situation, but in regards to the conversation around anti-blackness within the black collective, it is there. And even when we talk about the elements of class and wealth, and even when you throw education into the mix, you start seeing things all the time. Um, one of the best things my relatives told me when I moved to D.C. for Howard was like, when you go to Howard, enjoy Howard, but also enjoy D.C. Do not just live in a Howard bubble, because what's going to end up happening is you're going to almost put yourself into a specific class where you almost alienate the residents of the city, and you're going to see yourself as better than everybody else who's here, and then you're not going to get the real D.C. experience, and pretty much you, you pretty much just be a gentrifier. And so the good thing for me, fortunately, is I took the advice, and like I was able to enjoy D.C. and Howard as well, because I'll be honest, at a lot of HBCUs, because of the locations they tend to be in sometimes, sometimes the students come to these schools and they kind of look down on the people or the residents that are in the areas. 
And so that is an issue that exists within the collective. And so I hope people will learn to do better. Um, but yeah, my family was like, don't come over here trying to be all high and mighty, especially, and I couldn't anyway, because I was from Spanaway, Washington, which was like, you know, one step from a trailer park town. So I, I'd be one to talk. But, um, you know, fortunately, I learned to, you know, I fell in love with the city. That's why I'm still here. And now I'd like work and work in the community. So, you know, all right. Let's keep it moving. Um, <laughs> Kim Bronson going in on all the comments. She said, Kim ain't working on nothing. She's just slapping her name on other people's work. Mm, that's what a lot of these entertainers do when they be having these clothing lines and stuff. They're not in there actually drawing the outfits and stuff. No, they got other people doing everything and all they got to do is put their name on it. You know what I mean? That's like Even like the idea of like, a, a Trump Tower. People thought Donald Trump built the, the high rise. Like, no, like it was already gone, it was already being built. He just bought the contract for the name. Like most of these buildings are named after people who just pretty much, you know, purchased the rights for the name. They didn't build and purchase the building or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, I'm gonna keep it moving. Um the IRS has a letter. This is from A Dove. A Dawes. The IRS has a letter out that the nanny is an employee, so he owes taxes, and he's wait, I don't know who this is about, and he's be better following employment laws. I'm, pretty, I'm not sure who that's about, so I, I have to, you have to give me context. I don't, I don't know who that's about, unless, or maybe that's about Ryan Coogler. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't do Bank of America. All right, we're gonna keep it moving. Huh, and I still didn't even get to write down all the notes I want to write, but that's cool. Um, Chris Brown, I'm gonna be real quick on um, he had recently been accused of a sexual assault, and pretty much, I think that case is about to fall apart because Chris was smart and held on to every text message that exists. Um, and so, if you get a chance to see the conversation that existed between him and the accuser, um, and again, I'm not somebody who's ever going to be an apologist for any kind of crime or whatever that that you know is detrimental to somebody's experience. However, there's also no secret that a lot of times black individuals, especially black men sometimes, are the target of other women from other races and other groups of people because they recognize the system works against us to begin with. But when you look at this woman's text messages, um, and again, Chris already got enough going on. So it's like, Chris, you need to lay low anyway. Stop running around with some of these folks. You need to watch who you keep around. Um, the text messages kind of negate anything that she would put in the claim because it seems like she thought she was in a relationship or at least a good friendship with him and i think he might have just saw her as just a good time and so they had a good time a lot and you know all of that's written there um and i think once you know you read the rest of the messages he kind of starts to slowly just kind of slow down communication with her uh, i don't know the, the later details that come but it, again it seems like she was more so frustrated that she didn't like the way that she was treated by Chris, so let me make a claim. That's what it comes off as to me. All right, some of y'all gonna hate me for saying that, but it's just if you read all the messages, stuff doesn't align because it, you can't really see a timeline of when these things would have happened in regards to communication. But I mean, it, I could still be wrong. But um, her attorney recently just stepped down from the case, um, and I think you have to recognize too that when you're dealing with different groups of people, especially in anything sexually, and you're a public figure recognize that people are going to have different perspectives of different things. And so depending on how you treat people, you never know how they're going to respond later down the line or what they're going to try to use against you. Like we have so many entertainers who fall victim to people that are trying to extort them for money or other different things that take place. Or if they can't get their way, well, we're going to make sure you just have nothing. You know what I mean? It's even like, so I'm going to fight me on this too, but even like when you go back to Michael Jackson's first accuser, like the fact that, you know, the accuser's father wanted Michael to invest like $20 million in his little film project and Michael wasn't interested. And so he had a vendetta and said, all right, well, we're going to make a whole claim that you messed with, you know, little boys and so on and so forth. And they have all this stuff going and look what that did to, you know, the rest is history, but straight chaos. And then, you know, after the man dies, they want to say, okay, well, actually none of it was really true. The father just had a vendetta. And I'm like, well, great. Well, the man's dead now, but you know, that's life. Um, so folks need to be careful. And I think with Chris, again, because Chris already has a past with a lot of stuff. Remember that other time where, um, was it the thing where the woman was saying he was holding her hostage in there? And I, and I think he wasn't even at the house that day or something like that. I don't know, but just these celebrities have to be, um, careful. And again, Chris has done his things in the past, but I feel like Chris has at the same time tried to clean himself up to an extent. So, you know, it is what it is. I don't have a whole lot to say on people like Chris and Trey and all these people who keep falling into these situations because I'm like, why do y'all keep putting yourselves in environments for there even to be 
that kind of opportunity for someone to believe something like that could have happened to them. Like, watch who you keep around. But whatever. Um, I don't know. Um, anyway, somebody said, what's the name of this series? That was the African-Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. Um, was that one hidden? It's a really, really dope um, documentary. And I mean, they go in depth with everything. They talk about a lot of cities. So like New Bedford, Massachusetts, there's a segment in there in regards to like what was happening with the black establishments that moved there. It goes into really great detail about like, um, you know, the origins of like Juneteenth, what was happening in all the states in relation to slavery, what was happening after slavery, what was happening during Reconstruction, how white rage pretty much undid the 40 acres in the mule, how people got all their land stolen, you know, and taken back from the government. We've slowly talked about um, the conversation around Ayers land and what's been happening, especially in the Southeast region, like when we're talking about the Carolinas and Georgia and how a lot of that land was, you know, taken back and so on and so forth. And, and now it's being turned into golf courses and, and resorts because, you know, with these heirs land plots and everything like that, there's so much litigation and stuff behind it. But, you know, he jumps into the origins of that, jumps into the, you know, the forties and the fifties and the Jim Crow. And like, the, it's really good. I've always enjoyed that um, series. Every time, it, every time it comes on PBS, I'll sit there all day, you know, it comes on like a Saturday or Sunday at like 9 a.m. and will be on till four o'clock because, you know, they got to put the infomercials and try to convince you to buy the $90 DVD set or whatever or donate to the network. And I'll sit there and watch it the whole time, every time. All right, let's keep it moving. Oh, Spoken Wisdom says, same with college buildings and endowments. They are named after the person donating the most money. That's true, too, um, which is another great conversation I'm going to get to in a little bit. I think I wrote it down. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get to that. Good. All right. All right. All right. I'm going to keep it moving. Um, oh, I was reading. These are more so tidbits that aren't super heavy. But I was reading there's a few shows that have been canceled. So I saw Nick Cannon's um, talk show is already is pretty much being canceled. The Real, I've only seen a handful of those episodes. It's been canceled. Um, but, you know, I think the issue that's happening with a lot. Of, and, oh, yeah, well, I think Wendy, Wendy's out of there, too, right? They're going to switch with Sherry Shepard. And I hate to be that person, but I don't think the Sherry Shepard show is going to make it either. Um, I think the issue that's happening with a lot of the talk shows is that they're not giving you anything. Um, what separates talk shows in 2022 from talk shows in the 80s, 90s, maybe even almost early 2000s is that shows then actually covered issues that people wanted to hear about. There were actual bits and pieces that, you know, were controversial or, you know, they really had dialogues about things that mattered. Most talk shows today are just celebrity culture. Invite whatever celebrities on there, talk about your kids, talk about what project you're working on, how we're going to make cookies, and that's the show. And so I think too many people are getting a lot of the same thing. And then a lot of these shows are also marketed to younger demographics. So I feel like something like The Real is marketed to younger Black women. I feel like the Nick Cannon show is marketed to pretty much a 35 and down crowd. And the issue is those are crowds that are at work during the day or in college, in classes. And so when you look back at the Oprah's and the Phil Donahue's and the Sally Jesse Raphael's, those shows were marketed to housewives that stayed home and retired you know, adults. And that's why their ratings were so high, because people were home to sit and watch those shows. A lot of people are working right now. Now, fortunately, for some people, they have the luxury to work from home. But I think a lot of the shows, because everybody's doing the same thing, you know, there's not a loyalty to a lot of the shows. Like if I take the Kelly Clarkson show, the Ellen show, the Nick Cannon show, the Tamron Hall kind of sometimes has some topics, but her show's kind of boring, to be honest. I'd be trying to support it, but her show's be dry. Um what other shows are out there? You know, the real, like they all kind of have the same subject matter all the time. At least, I mean, at least the view, they're going to talk some politics for the first 20 minutes and cuss each other out and then keep it moving. And then they get back to the bacon cookies. But, you know, it's like most of the shows are all doing the same thing. And so I just think people aren't really that interested. You get more entertainment from social media. And so I think they would have to kind of restructure a lot of these shows. I think maybe a Wendy Williams worked because it was kind of like trash TV gossip. And so people were interested in that, um, or at least the first half of her show. But yeah, I think all of the shows, everybody's doing the same thing. So there's no interest. You know, I mean, Dr. Phil kind of has his thing where he kind of exploits, you know, the hardships of, of working class white Americans with drug problems. And so, you know, he can keep his viewership, but they're not talking about anything. 
So who's going to sit and watch? I don't want to watch 30 different shows about baking cookies and whatever celebrity, what's their favorite, you know, restaurant to eat at. Cause I'm, it's not like I can afford to go there. Uh, or if I go, all I can get is, you know, a glass of water and some bread and, and more bread, please, more bread, please. You know, and maybe an appetizer that's like $40. Um, but like when I think back to like a Phil Donahue, like that show, I'd be on YouTube watching them old shows. He had everybody and their mom on there about any and everything. You know, he would have Louis Farrakhan on there. And that that might be one of my favorite episodes because, I mean, he had that crowd in there stressed. Okay, them, that white woman got that mic. I wish I could grab a mic. I, I took the half of my lav lamp. She was like... We people, we have done backflips to make you people comfortable. And I always wanted to ask her, like, what were the backflips? Just tolerating the fact that we were black and we were in the same space with you? Like, wh what did you actually give up? Nothing. All right. You haven't opened up your neighborhood. You know, you, you guys aren't breaking your necks to, to shift the changes in the job market and education and housing and health. You ain't did none of that. But she backflips to make you people comfortable. And she said it with disgust, like she had just done so much. And, and what was so funny is, like, if you watch the episode... All he was doing was just talking about the politics of race in America and systemically the issues. But again, when we talk about race, because so many people are not well versed in the conversation, every time you have a conversation about race with people who don't have the range for the conversation, they center themselves in it and look at race from an individual standpoint. And the conversation of race should always be, in my opinion, talked about from a systemic and a collective standpoint of how a pattern can operate and affect an entire collective. Because otherwise you're always going to get, not all of them, not all white people. And I'm like, well, if you want to say not all white people, well, not all white people are fighting against racism either. So where are we going with this? So, you know, but yeah, Phil Donahue used to have like, you know, Farrakhan on there. Um, he would have politicians. The soldier was on there. Um, who else? Um, guy with the hair. Guy with the hair. What's the one with the hair? God, I can't think of his name. Y'all know who I'm talking about. He was on there. Um, Char, I think Sharzad Ali from back in the day, if you remember her, she was on there. I mean, she he used to have Latoya Jackson on there back when Latoya and the, the Jackson family was all still fighting and and, and button heads. So that would be on there. They would have, you know, all these different groups that were protesting about things. No, it wasn't Don King. Um, this civil rights activist. I'm so mad that this guy's name is not popping up right now. It's the, he has the, like the salt and pepper fro right now and the black glasses and a white wife. But, um, um, Cornell West, thank you. Um, you know, he was on there. So they had all these different people like, you know, they, there was actual content that people would want to sit and, and, and sit through because it was interesting. You know, it was stuff that, you know, brought people's attention. So this stuff that I think we're too obsessed with celebrity culture. We can enjoy it. We can consume it. But that can't be our only experience and livelihood in regards to what you do in your leisure time. Like, who cares? God, I'm. you know what I mean? Um, anyway, let me see. Um, so yeah, yeah, I just think they need real solutions. Um, I think I wrote all that down. Yep, perfect. Um, roll that paper down. All right, we can do these sheets. Okay, can I talk about the stupid trucker convoy for a second, too? So we know that there has been like the trucker convoy, and they decided to come to DC this week and last weekend. Um, fortunately, I did not get caught up in it, but they, they weren't organized, they couldn't even do that right, you know. And so this convoy is all about the frustrations they have in regards to the COVID mandates and the vaccines and everything like that. So they decided they were going to, you know, get all their trucks from California and come all the way to D.C. and and, and stir up some things and block off the freeways. And D.C. was going to suffer because the people need to be heard. And so my issue is, one, again, at this point, everything's been lifted. Most cities have lifted the mandates and the vaccination card requirements aren't required for most restaurants and movie theaters and games anymore. And at this point, the United States just said, COVID is a wrap. So just go ahead and live your lives and do whatever y'all want to do. So it's like, if y'all are going to do the trucker convoy stuff, y'all are late to the party. And for me, it seems like there's so many groups of people who are just mad to be mad. They don't really know what they're mad at, but they just want to be mad. And so they get mad. And then the first thing they would talk about is freedom. Sometimes I wish they didn't teach us that we were free in K through 12, because a lot of Americans have taken that and run with it. And they are under the assumption that Every country aside from the United States has some kind of dictator where everybody is chained to a rope and must peel potatoes for 36 hours a week. And then the other you know, set of hours for the week, you know, they must punch bricks with their bare hands until the bricks fall into sand so that they can make beaches for the wealthy. Like people are in this space where they think nobody is free. And so they use freedom for everything. So anytime somebody is inconvenient, it's my freedom, my, my freedom. And the problem is they talk about all this freedom until it comes to the freedoms of other people that don't reflect who they are. Then all of a sudden they want to be oppressive. Then they want to create all kinds of laws. Then they want to talk about CRT and ban conversations from the classroom. Then they want to ban specific groups of people from getting married. Then they want to ban 
specific people from being able to go and do whatever they need to do in regards to reproductive care. They didn't want to ban people from having access to all these different kinds of things. You know, they want to stop people from voting. Now, all of a sudden, all that freedom goes out the window. But because, you know, they actually wear a mask on a plane, you know, with 300 people while you're 37,000 feet in the air for, you know, five hours, all of a sudden you're freedom. Like, freedom, freedom, freedom. Like, I wish they didn't teach us that because people have taken that and run with it. You know, and if you don't hear freedom, the next word is communism and socialism. And then when you ask somebody to, you know, can you describe what socialism and communism is? They can't ever tell you. Can't ever tell you. It's the socialist communist. The, the, you know, remember like when Obama first ran, he's a socialist and a communist. And and and, 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 and back then it was the, the Russians and the Chinese and da, 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 da. And now the tables have flipped. We got the stuff with Ukraine and now all the same ones ranting and raving about freedom. All of a sudden they all of a sudden the biggest allies to Russia now. I'm like, y'all move the goalposts everywhere, all day, figure out what y'all want to be mad at. Like, you get y'all stuff together. But yeah, and so when they got up here, they couldn't block anything. DC was like, y'all not about to block up no freeways. And so literally for the last two or three weeks, at every exit on 295 until you get out of DC, 395, all the 95s in the area, there is a snowplow truck and like two police cars at every exit because they were just wishing somebody might have thought they would have blocked some traffic. Um, and so, yeah, they, they just didn't get anything aligned and together. But then, of course, you have somebody like a Ted Cruz who, again, he's still trying to milk this thing. So he went and met with, I guess, the trucker convoys and did this whole rant about how his freedoms are all compromised and how when he gets on the plane, every plane he's been on the last year and a half, every pilot comes out of the cockpit to just hug and thank him for fighting for freedom. And just, you know, there's so many people have just been thanking him. And I'm just like, Ted Cruz is the biggest opportunist at everything. Hmm. Every time there's something that he can latch on to to make some kind of political point, he's going to run and do it. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, remember the, the 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 law clerk where she decided like any same-sex couple she wasn't going to allow to get married because she said it was against the Bible. And it's kind of like, I, I hear where you're at with whatever it is that you believe in. However, there's a separation of church and state. So you can't utilize what it is that you believe in and, and, and apply it as law. And so she ended up becoming, you know, charged and convicted. And so when they finally released her from the jailhouse, you know, Ted is out there with the podium and the speech and the, like the white evangelicals out there. And they tried to have like a whole church service about this. And I'm like, Ted, you're already like one of the most terrible people in the world. Let's not pretend that all of a sudden you're godly now. Um, and I still got smoke for him in regards to like the Supreme Court stuff. Now, I'm not going to I'll be honest that the Supreme Court pick nominee was not my top choice out of the women in the pool that were there. But still, she's definitely the most qualified or she's more qualified out of any, anybody who's on the bench right now. But, you know, when he did that whole bit about it's offensive to white people for them to go and specifically, you know, pick a, a black woman to be on the Supreme Court. And I'll save my conversation about black spaces and high spaces later down the line. But, you know, for me, it was like, okay, it's offensive to white people for, you know, the president to pick somebody black. And I'm just like, are we, is that what we're doing today? And now y'all want to run into this conversation of qualifications today? Like, let's be honest, pretty much if a black woman, let alone is even up for consideration for the Supreme Court, that means she's qualified as hell because you already know when it comes to these doors, black folks can barely get into anything. And a lot of them that do get through the cracks have to sell out. But, you know, for me, when he started saying it's offensive, I was like, if we want to start talking offensive, let's talk some real offenses, Ted. Like, it's offensive. The president called your wife ugly and you did nothing about it. And you still got to lay next to her every night. I don't know what kind of marriage y'all have, but y'all need to work that out. You know, what's offensive is the former president said that your daddy played a role in the killing of JFK and you did nothing about it. Like, that's offensive to me. You know what I mean? For me, the snowstorm in Texas, your people, your stakeholders, freezing to death, power grid knocked out. People are dying and you get on a plane to go to Mexico. And then when you get called out about it, you try to hop back on another plane and play it off like you were just dropping off your family. And then you blame your daughter and say, well, she wanted to go to Mexico. So you like you blame your daughter in front of 330 million people. That's offensive. You know what I mean? Or more offensive when you finally lost the, the last bid to run for president and you're doing a concession speech and you tried to hug the people next to you. You elbowed your wife in the face all, just so you could get to your friend. Like, what kind of marriage do y'all have? I mean, can you? Put some cameras up. Now, that's a reality show I'll watch since the Kardashians think it's so hard to share their life. Ted, open them cameras up. I want to see what your household is like, right? And what's even more offensive is when we talk about the Michael Wayne Haley case. Let's get to some real stuff. If you remember, back in the 90s, Michael Wayne Haley was an individual that was arrested for stealing a freaking calculator, right? And so because of the laws that took place in the state, and this is when he was like still in like um, the judicial side of the government in Texas, right? Michael was sentenced to two years. 
Um, but there were some specific laws that were in play that could have made it where he'd have to be in jail for an even longer period of time. Ted Cruz was so pressed because he knew that he was going to start jumping into a political career and he wanted to really win over conservatives. He wanted to make an example out of the calculator, man. And so he went all the way to the Supreme Court to ensure that this man would serve 16 years in prison for a calculator. And the man ended up serving six years. But, you know, so when we want to talk about offensive, get out of my face because we'll be here all day. Like so, sometimes I can't say what I want to do to some of these people because I'll be demonetized ASAP because YouTube be getting us out of here. But, man, some of these folks get away with saying and doing so much and nothing be happening. It, it just it mm, irks my soul, irks my soul. Hot mess. Let me pause and read some comments. We got up under my skin. Ted Cruz is, well, I would run for, not run for president. I'd run for office just to debate him just so I could cuss him out on the stage. I wouldn't even want to win. I just want to cuss him out in front of the whole country because everybody wants to do it anyway. Um, man, anyway. Offensive. Don't get me started. You know, somebody called your wife ugly and you did nothing about it. Nothing about it. Okay. Mm. I'm sorry. In, in my opinion, your wife and your mother and your sisters and grandma and the aunties are all supposed to be the most beautiful women in your life. Even if you don't believe it, you better always preach and claim it and proclaim it. You know, sometimes folks be posting pictures of certain relatives and, and the way that they would describe them, you think it was Holly Berry. And rightfully so. That's how it's supposed to be with the women in your life. And you don't sit here and let a man call your wife ugly and then you're going to endorse him and then all of a sudden cape it and, and kiss his boots all day. There is no way. Kind of not. What? Kind of nonsense. Hmm. And don't get me started on him trying to pass as fully white. He'd be acting, you know, he does not acknowledge that Latino side at all. He hides all of that. That's what I said. Again, that anti-blackness is strong. Folks will literally erase their own heritage so they can get into white spaces. Because a lot of people, like I've said before, they come to America to be white. So it is what it is. All right. Um, I'm going to read some comments here. Val said, yeah, they covered issues back in the day and also discussed solutions. Right. And sometimes even if the solution was wrong, at least it was an attempt to try and do something. Um, man. Now, I'm not going to lie. The Kelly Clarkson show, I don't really watch, but I think it's kind of dope that she sings at the beginning of all the shows. I was like, OK, that's different, you know, for a talk show. But um, I don't do a whole lot. I'm not a big talk show person. Now, when I was little, you know, I used to watch all the court shows. I'll watch some people's court real quick and like Judge Judy, even though I don't really F with her like that. But like, you know, my grandma used to have us watching all the court shows when we were kids. So it was like Judge Mills Lane, Judge Joe Brown, people's court when the guy was still on it. Um, who else had a court show? I mean, everybody and their mama had court shows, but we used to, grandma used to have us watching those. And then Forgive or Forget for Mother Love, <laughs> if you remember that. That was that was the show where if you had beef with somebody, I don't know, you, you, you slept with your best friend's wife. And so now you're on there and you're trying to apologize. And so the way that the show works is you tell the whole story about all the shenanigans you did and why you're so sorry. And then after you get through all that, there's a black or there's a door with a black curtain. And Mother Love would, you know, say, OK, if they forgive you, they're going to be in the door. If not, they have a special video message for you. OK, let's open that door. And then they would open that door and either the person would be out there and ready to come hug and they'd be crying or it will be a black curtain. And the person did not forgive them. So then the person telling the story starts crying and then they, oh, they have a special video for you. And then the video will come on and that person would just drag that person. How, you know, I don't even know why you thought I was going to come in that show and forgive you, first of all. F you, you, and they would just go down this long list. You don't ever got to worry about coming to my life again. We are done. Da, 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 da. See you in hell. And then <laughs> that would be the show. And it would be so bad. It would be like women on there who have been like abandoned from the husband or the kid. That show was off the chain. But no, this is what my grandma had us watching. You know, you know, grandma, oh, and then, you know, grandparents, they was watching the stories. So then the stories came on. You had to sit and watch the stories as kids. Play with your little toys on, on the floor and you got the stories on. But, um, Anyway, <laughs> uh, Calypso once said Montel had Sylvia Brown. Remember that? And then she was such a scammer. I used to really think she was a real psychic. Sylvia Brown was the lady that used to be the psychic Montel would have on. And then it turned out that so many of her professions or whatever she would say were wrong. There was the woman on there who was talking about her missing daughter and if they could find her. And the woman was like, oh, yes, she's still alive. She's in this. You go to the north and go 10 degrees west. And it turned out the mom had killed her own kids. Like, really? Um, hot mess. She, yeah, I think she got sued a few times. I think she's dead now. But, um, yeah, I think she died. But, um, yeah, anyway. Oh, there, there, yeah, there was Jerry Springer. 
But Jerry Springer had a specific purpose. You knew what you were getting. You knew it was specifically going to be some good trash TV specifically for that. All right. And I'm not saying everything that comes on TV has to have purpose, but it's just like y'all going to have to mix it up a bit. Because I ain't going to lie. I watch some trash TV on occasion. I, I'm not even going to lie. That ratchet Jocelyn Hernandez show is my ish just because of how terribly good it is. I don't recommend watching it, but it is very entertaining for all the wrong reasons. Me and my friends be dying watching it. Um, but yeah, anyway. Oh, somebody said Mari. Yes, you, you're not the father show. Uh, and it's interesting because Mari used to have a totally different um, setup. It was actually like a show with real issues. And then when they realized what the ratings were, it was on. Um, all right. Let's see. Lachey Wilson said banned from saying the gay word. Yeah, like the law in Florida with the, like the don't say gay thing where you don't, they're not even going to acknowledge people's experience. I'll just leave it alone. I understand the conversations of sexuality are very complicated and there is a gray area when it comes to where does this fall in line when you start bringing children into the conversation and when are they ready for those kind of conversations. But these laws that are coming out are just from a place of just straight hatred. It's not even about concern for anything. It's just these people just are on, on a power trip, which is why literally everything under the sun is under attack except for for conservative white men everybody else even white women are catching smoke everybody is under attack politically in all of these different laws that are being put out there um uh but calvin doesn't know what, what, what that i don't know hold on wait a minute hold on we got somebody trying to shake the table so we're gonna shake it for real hold on let me come on back because somebody trying to get up in here um damn oh what calvin doesn't know is that ukraine is full of neo-nazis study your history and do your research first of all ha, i do know that which is why if you've seen my channel i've only said one thing about ukraine and i said specifically the u.s don't need to jump up in there let's mind our business i don't know why people always say do your research that's like a trigger line for me now it's no secret that much of eastern europe is extremely racist however that does not negate the fact that putin is literally blowing up and trying to snatch up a country and that's really in regards to the fact that he needs access to the black sea so that they can have better trade because russia is pretty much landlocked because all of the water surrounding it you can't have any ports in any of northern Russia, because all of that is frozen, when you get to the eastern side, the same issue you run into. Snatching up Ukraine would give him access to the Black Sea. That would open up a world of opportunity in regards to commerce, in addition to the fact that he wants to recreate what was once there in regards to the USSR. And so by getting into the Baltic region and snatching up some of the Baltic countries, it would help him to kind of rebuild what was already there. In addition to the fact as much as that Putin is on his little cuckoo train, there were some agreements in the 90s where there was a conversation about the fact that the U.S. and NATO would not expand any further east, and they did anyway. And so now you have this battle of ego and power where folks want to do this and, and so on and so forth. And so here we are. So, yeah, don't try me because I always know what I'm talking about. The range is there for the conversations. And I, like I said before, Ukraine is its situation. I've seen what's been going on with the black people that are over there. And that's why I'm like sometimes recognize we're not welcome in all these places. I understand there's conversations of education and access, but recognize where you're going to. Now, with that being said, Putin is full of crap for going over there and killing and blowing up all these random people. But like I said before, the U.S. has done exactly the same thing. I don't think we should be over there. I don't believe in us sending no kids over there. And I think the U.S. has tried their best to kind of keep this as diplomatic as possible possible by responding economically um, in regards to sanctions and everything else like that. Uh, and But I just think what's happening with Ukraine, I think that has to be something Europe has to manage. Call the U.S. last. We should be the last one on the list, not first one in line. But whatever. That's just how I feel. Y'all ain't got to agree. But I just I, we, we got money for everything else except for what the people need. Y'all just sent six point whatever billion dollars over there for aid but you know you got rent moratoriums and that have gone that have expired and people are getting evicted we have the conversations around student loan debt you know we have all these issues that are taking place all over in regards to people really suffering and y'all keep y'all always got money for bombs that, that, mm. anyway i'm gonna keep it moving um but whatever 2008 b scott said um yeah has been a had been this weird realignment where the GOP is anti-black, anti-socialist, pro-Russia, and the Dems are anti-black, anti-socialist people doing a red score call and wait, I'm sorry, doing a red scare calling everybody bots and stuff. There's just a lot going on. Politics in the United States is so tribal right now. And like I've said, you should never be the fan of any politician or any person in power. They work for you. 
Your job is to ensure that the things they said they were going to do, they were going to do. And if they don't do it, okay, well, we're going to make sure you feel the, the burn of that. And so like, and that was not endorsement of Bernie. I'm just saying that's just the line I had in my mind. Um, and so, yeah, we're in a space where people have become like diehard fans of politicians. I will never be a person that has any politician's name on my bumper sticker ever. Like, what, what do you get out of that? I'm never going to be a person that's a part of the this squad or the, this. What I'm not doing none of that. I just need to know who has the policy that makes sense. Who has the policy that affects the people collectively in a more positive manner? Who has the policy that actually gets to the things that people are asking for? So I'm not going to blindly support and rally behind somebody because they look like me or because they belong to the party that I tend to vote for most likely or because, you know, they went on whatever entertainment related show and did a dance and they seem a little bit cooler than the other guy. Like people are in a space where they become fans of politicians or almost obsessed. I said that about the whole MAGA movement, like some of those people are to a space where they're really, you know, they're ready and willing to go and kill people in the name of a man that would not do the same for them. And a man, you know, they're willing to go and even in regards to like COVID and every time Trump gave us a solution, people went and did it and some people died. Like the, the time he told the people to use this stuff and people didn't realize he was talking about something different and the, the guy ate the aquarium food or the aquarium cleaner stuff and died. Like you can't be that loyal to an individual like, what are y'all doing? And so, yeah, politics is weird. It's, it's tribal. It's us first. Then we got to get the radical. This, the, and so look at the commercials that come on to the radical left wing Democrat. The, this, the, the, it's chaos. And so there's a whole lot of murky stuff. And so you can't ever get to the real solutions or really understand what the politics are because everything's a game. And then by the time you find a candidate that you actually like, they're already bought out. You know what I mean? Every corporation has already put offers on the table. And so by the time they get into office, after you've done the canvassing and the, the, this, that, and the third, they're a fraction of what they're supposed to be. It's kind of like The Simpsons. All right. Stay with me. The Simpsons at one point in time was one of my favorite, favorite shows growing up, especially season one through eight. Those are like some of the best. So that's some of the best writing in comedy, in my opinion. It's the perfect show that kind of mirrors and highlights the mockery of what would be the United States, in my opinion, and just how things were done. However, by the time you get into like the modern seasons that are here now, pretty much none of the original writers are in the room. So this show is now like a shell of what it used to be because it has the same name. It has kind of a similar animation, but the people that wrote the show and the ideas, all that, all those people are gone. And so, yes, it's The Simpsons, but it's not what was presented. That's what most of these politicians are. They initially come up and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm gonna do, we're going to do all these different things. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then when they finally get in there, you get a shell of what was promised. You might get a little something here and there, but most of the stuff that you were hoping to buy for, don't worry about. Like that's American politics again. And then they got to run for reelection. So soon they're going to be coming to your churches and, and knocking on doors and they about to start singing Negro spiritual soon. So be ready. Um, and then at the same time, celebrities are going to wait until almost voting time to show up and they want to shake the table themselves and start movements and tell us who we need to vote for. Like everything be unorganized. Everybody, if y'all going to do the politics, do it right. You can't show up after early voting has started and after the primaries have already gone through and now we're down to two candidates and everybody wants to start trying to have their two cents about what we need to do. It's too late. The, the system, the game has already started. It's in like round six. We late to that. Whatever. Um. And that's that. All right, let's keep it moving. Javon said, wasting their time. They're fake oppressed. What is free? That's my point. And I don't even think we're free like that in this country. People just, again, you say it enough times, people buy into it. It's kind of like, you know, the idea of American exceptionalism. Our politicians do this all the time. It doesn't matter how terrible the country is doing. Every politician is going to go and do their state of the union and say everything is amazing. Even if it's not the state of the union, if you are in the Senate or in Congress and you have to go back to those town halls, you're going to present everything to be amazing, amazing, amazing. I remember when um, I think around 06, 07, 08 and nine is when I started to realize like America was kind of, in my opinion, on a decline as far as like prosperity. And I started recognizing that things were not really that good. But every time I watched a speech from like Bush number two, or even when Barack Obama came in, 
even if they had to say all the bad things, and the first thing they would always say, but America is still the most powerful country in the world. We're still the best. We have the best. We have the best. We have the best. And so you give enough people enough of the best speech, they almost forget about the real issues. And the best serves as a really great distraction that we can celebrate and ride on and jump in. That's why I was so annoyed um, when I saw like even the, the, I know they were celebrating like the March on Selma and you had Kamala and them walking across the bridge. And let me say this. That could have been a really great thing to celebrate and march and sing about had they been able to pass some of the voting rights legislation that was on the table, those two bills, the John Lewis bill and the other bill that was out there in regards to making sure that elections were free and fair to everyone. However, those pieces of legislation, they couldn't get them through. So it's like, what are we marching and singing for? Because at this point in time, this is just a symbolic gesture. And for me, like I've always said in regards to symbolism. Symbolism is more so when you celebrate what it is that you come from and how we were able to come together and do it and look where we are now. We're not there. So what are we singing and marching and chanting for and doing photo ops? And I recognize like a lot of people that makes people feel good and people need the, the good bits to kind of keep you at peace and, and help you sleep better during the terrible times. But we have to also be honest and be realistic in regards to what things are happening. And I think I've been saying this for years in regards to symbolism. I don't, you, you're not going to move me on symbolism. It doesn't do anything for me because I, I can't do anything with it. It's just a feeling. And once I go to sleep and wake up, I'm, that feeling's gone. And so, you know, if they want to do that, listen, get the voting rights stuff passed. And for the people that keep jumping in my comments, talking about well, what's voting rights got to do with black people? We need to do, do. understand that this is all a game. This is all a system. And I recognize that we are burnt out and folks are over it. These politicians keep lying and so on and so forth. But now look at what you're also seeing as we're burning out. You're seeing the rise of these intense, extremely half cuckoo people running for office with these outrageous laws that are actually passing that will affect these generations that are up and coming in regards to education, in regards to housing, in regards to health care, in regards to jobs, in regards to just our well-being and our livelihood. And you also need to recognize that we also do have to get older. We will have to eventually become senior citizens citizens. And we have to pray to God that there's, you know, social security for us and that there's going to be Medicare and Medicaid and all these different programs and stuff that will still be there. However, if we constantly sit out because we're frustrated about what's going on and we just going we just going to let it all burn so we can teach people a lesson. You can teach people a lesson, but your own collective is also going to be collateral to that lesson. And the problem is rich people don't learn lessons because they're rich. Who cares? You know what I mean? They're, OK, so think about like even Trump, right? The thing that always made me laugh, Susan Collins, you know, that's the senator out of Maine who's always, I, I'm concerned. I'm concerned. Every time somebody has a horrible, I, I'm concerned. I, I'm so, I'm so concerned. I'm, I'm concerned. Concerned. She always concerned and ain't, ain't nothing changing. She voting for all the terrible stuff. I'm concerned. So I remember when Trump got impeached the first time and when she voted not to convict him, she was like, he learned his lesson. And then January 6th happened like a month later. Like this is the stuff I'm talking about. Wealthy people don't learn lessons from the working class in the middle. They, you don't learn lessons. So there's nothing you can teach them because they don't care. If they don't get it from you, they're going to get it from somebody else. And one of the things I'll say in regards to the two-party system, you guys know I'm not a fan of the two-party system, but sadly it's the system we live under. I'm all about third party and using a third party to gain leverage in one of the two major parties to get what you want. It's unlikely that, th that a third party candidate will win a major election and win a whole bunch of seats in the House and in the Senate and win a lot of the local positions. However, if you can create a coalition that has enough representation that can influence one of the major parties, because without the support of that coalition, that party can't win. Now you have some leverage to work with. And I think that's what we have to get within our politics, like recognizing that, OK, who do we have the most leverage with? Both parties, in my opinion, are trash. But I, in my opinion, you can fight me. I don't care. There's more leverage with the Democrat Party because Republicans don't need black people to win. They don't at all, which is why they don't really even come towards us because they're going to be all right. They recognize most of the time black people aren't voting for them. All right. Democrats need us. For some reason, they continue to drop the ball. And I think they are convinced that they can pull enough of the Latino community to make up for the, the loss that they're going to continue to have in regards to the black demographic that's like, F all y'all, I'm out. But I don't think they realize that the Latino community does not vote as a monolith. And what's interesting, when you look at voting patterns, nothing has really changed in the last 40 years. Even when you go back from Reagan onward, it's still those same percentages. Usually black people are going to vote 
close to the 90th percentile for the Democrats in whatever category it is for whoever's running for what. The other 10 percent, some of that's going to be for Republicans. And there's, there's going to be a fraction that chooses to vote for something else. In the Latino community, it's always going to be two thirds vote Democrat. The other third is going to vote for Republicans. And like it's just and then even when you talk about the white collective, only about 30 percent of white men are going to vote for Democrats. The other 70 are going to vote for Republicans, when it comes to white women, you're only going to get about 43% of white women to vote Democrats. The rest, 50 plus, are going to vote Republican. It's been the same pattern since Reagan. And so recognize how the politics work. But anyway, let's keep it moving. Um, why is my thing lapsing? Okay, here we go. Um, boom, boom, boom. And you know what's interesting, too? Because then when you get into the conversation of like conservatives and liberals, like, Republicans and right wing conservatives, like the thing that's so funny is a lot of black people are actually conservative in their views and they would actually align with a lot of the different views in regards to certain things. However, because Republicans and right wing conservatives have such racist policy, black folks are like, hell no, nah, we ain't about to set ourselves up for failure because we've seen the history of what y'all continue to do. That's why even when we got into 2020. And there was kind of an idea of, well, you know, maybe this could be the election to really teach the Democrats a lesson. So some folks are like, let's vote in for Trump, especially because, you know, he had the, whatever plan he claimed he had for black folks. And I'm like, y'all realize we just came out of four years where he didn't do anything for black folks. And what he did was just parade and claim that he had done the most for black folks, period. Like HBCU funding was cut under Trump. You know, people assumed, oh, no, he gave all this. No, it was $80 million. $80 million, okay? No. Like, and so I'm like, if he didn't do anything in the first four years, why would he do anything once he gets in during the second? Because there's no leverage or there's not a burden on him to have to do anything, you know? Um, and so it was interesting. And so I just think, and listen, this is not to give Biden a pass, because if you follow me, I was not excited about him either. Like, when we go back to those primaries, as we came into 20, um, what you call 2018, 2019, I was telling you all the people that had no business running and he was one of them, but he's here. So while he's here, like, what can we do here? Cause he drops the ball on everything. And I don't even know if he knows the day of the week it is sometimes, but like recognize all of this politics is a game. And so you have to recognize what's happening because people are going to play this game in whatever way they play. The minute you tap out, the decisions are going to be made for you either way. You know what I mean? There's so much foolery happening in both parties and even on the local levels. It's even like with the conversations of gentrification. And I think for people who live in D.C., I'm sorry, Mayor Bowser has to go. And I say that like even when you look at the report um, where, you know, she gave all of this land and property to these real estate developers for one freaking dollar. What? Like, look, let me see if I can find it for those in D.C. You can look it up yourself. Um, hold on. One dollar. I was hot when I read that. Like when you see the gentrification that's happening here and what's been happening where look, Ward 7 in D.C. still ain't got a grocery store, but you're giving wealthy people one dollar to develop high rises where they get to invest and end up making, you know, nine figures off of. But you one dollar. Meanwhile, we're in a housing crisis. Everything is expensive as hell. And hmm, all right, Bowser, that's your last term with me. Um, I, I hope I can find it. Ah, oh, if I can find it. Dang, man, I'm gonna find it because it's, 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 I didn't brought it up now, so now I gotta reference it for real. Um, come on, Bowser, where you at, woman? Um, but you know, that woman, I'm sorry, she's bought out uh, at this point. She's just, oh, here we go. There's an article on, and I'll tell you, it's called, if you go to, and this is 88.5, uh, WAMU.org, they have a great article. It's called Million Dollar Properties, One Dollar Deals. Can y'all see that? All right. This whole article just talks about how like there were all these developments that, you know, came into play in the D.C. area where, you know, all of these corporations. So we have Donatelli Development. Right. This is the thirty eight hundred block of Georgia Avenue. They bought the area for one dollar because, again, this is the city giving them, you know, pretty much an outlet to do do this or whatever. And then they ended up making ooh, oh, this big number. This is. Hold on, I can't, I can't, I'm blind. Hold on, this is, how many zeros is that? Uh, okay, so the developer personally got the pocket 1,800,000 to, I'm sorry, $1,800,216. The Nanny Helen building at 4,800, wherever street that is, $1. That developer made a cool $525,000 off of that. The Minnesota Benning phase, if you live in D.C., you know that whole strip by Benning Road, like going from like Minnesota Ave by the Metro and that bus terminal going down Benning Road. They got all a $10 deal from the government. And in return, they made. Now, this is $13 million here, $13 million from that deal. Strand Theater, 
All right, Blue Sky Development, $75 that they had to pay to the city of D.C. for all of this land to build this property. And the owner or the person that made the deal left with a cool $496,000. Um, and so in reality, of these different projects, $17 million has been made from people who literally spent less than, you know, a collective, what, freaking $300? That's our politics. And so you have black developers who, you know, they can't even get the approval from the loan, let alone from the city. Don't even go to the municipal buildings trying to get a favor. They're going to tell you to get out of here. And this is where we're at. This is why even when we talk about the language in our politics, recognize and be careful about what really is. That's why when the last administration was ranting about opportunity zones and that's all the stuff they did for black folks. I was like, did you guys look at the policy of what an opportunity zone was? That pretty much just sped up the process for gentrification. All it did was pretty much give tax credit and tax breaks to people who would develop in areas that were deemed, you know, areas that needed opportunity. This was pretty much every working class black neighborhood in America. And the problem was that pretty much the only people who would even get approved to, because you, it had to be a specific business um, and you already had to have the blueprints and the approval to build whatever it is that you're building. Most of those people were already developers. And so the majority of the opportunity zones and the stuff that was sold off ended up going to developers and people in hospitality. So the majority of what was created in these opportunity zones, instead of businesses that could help the community or schools or recreation centers or things that people actually needed or clinics, it was all hotels and high rises. And then because there was no clause in the line items in regards to the policy stating that if you build in a specific neighborhood, you know, a certain percentage of the people in this neighborhood have to be offered jobs in your building. A certain percentage of the amenities or the resources that this building will provide has to be provided to the people in this specific opportunity zone that you're in. None of that was in there. So wealthy people got to come in and buy up stuff and flip everything. It pretty much, it was like a long extended episode of all those shows you see on HGTV. Where it's like the people and they're like, oh, I'm a professional dog walker. And, you know, my husband, you know, he he folds paper towels at an organic paper shop. And our budget for the house is three point six million. That's what we're looking for. Anything under that, you know, we'll, it, you know, we'll, we might go up to like three point eight million. But that's about as much as we're going to do. That's where we kind of draw the line. And you're sitting there looking like, huh? What kind of jobs? All right. So that must be some generational wealth that's already in the family because ain't no way, you know, you walking dogs and you folding paper towels and y'all got three point eight million dollars for a house. Like that's literally what's happened within our politics in regards to real estate and the fact that we're now in a housing crisis because now you also have corporations buying up regular houses on the market where you have individual buyers who are trying to get their first or their second home and they can't because they're constantly being outbid by cash payers who have $740,000 cash to go at hand, as opposed to a person who might have just got approved for the $40,000 loans for the down payment and they've gone through all the process. But you know what person is going to take the deal where, okay, well, we have the person who has the $40,000 right now or the person who has a seven, or the company who has a 750 k This is housing right now. Anyway, I'm going so far off my little paper, but we, we are in our pocket tonight. All right. Anyway. Let's go. Here we go. Got to be going off on people. Um, we covered a lot tonight. Hey, Bibby. Yep, said voting rights still. The fact they're still trying to snatch our voting rights should tell you there's a reason why they don't want you trying to vote. I recognize we got a lot of really crappy candidates, but recognize what could happen if we could get some really good candidates in there, if people could organize, if there were coalitions that were funded. That's why when I look at a lot of these black celebrities that are just so wealthy and so revolutionary, they always, you know, always want to do something that's so pro-black. Like when it comes to the politics, I don't see y'all really pushing or supporting a lot of the grassroots organizations or politicians that are really trying to actually implement positive change from a standpoint that isn't about just making rich people richer. Then, then the celebrities are quiet, but whatever. Uh, let's keep it moving. Um, 2008, 2008, Scott, you always, for some reason, your comments catch my eye every time. I'm not picking favorites with the comments. I just be seeing the comment. But anyway, um, says, yep, trade concerns and concerns about NATO pointing weapons on his border. People want to say he's just crazy, um, but some of it's rational. He's still loony to me, but I think, uh, again, at one point you have to just remember, like, the Soviet Union and the United States slash NATO were like these two huge powers, right? And so now one has lost a lot and they're trying to rebuild it. So they're going to come and do what it is that they do. Um, somebody said Calvin came back with actual research. That's what I'm saying. Like, don't give me that research line. That's a trigger for me. <laughs> like, don't do it. Um, do I know Quadir Howard? 
What do you think about his more original? I don't think I know. The only Quadir I know is the guy that used to be the VJ on MTV. I think I don't think that's the same person. No, I don't know who Quadir is. Sorry, I don't get a chance to watch a lot of YouTube channels, but I've lately I've been trying to support a lot of actually. Some of you guys have channels, and sometimes I'll pop in on your stuff. Um, but there's not a lot of channels I really get a chance to sit and watch. The ones I think I've told you before, I like Bright Sun Films channel, but that's like a documentary channel about like businesses that may have not necessarily done well. That's a really good channel. Um, the Cheddar channel is okay, but their videos are boring, but they're informative. Um, the Lectual Media channel is pretty good. Um, I really like her content. She's very detailed and organized. Um, who have I been watching as of late? Oh, the detail is, that's probably one of my favorite. That's like a Michael channel. And then like uh, Violet Reality. I don't, I don't think they've made videos in a while, but that's like the Prince channel. Like I, I'm a big music dork. So I love all the behind the scenes of how they made this album or how they, that's my lane. So I love those kind of channels. Um, every now and then that, that the guy that has, it's called Honest. He's kind of, he kind of talks pop culture. I'll watch his stuff on occasion just to kind of be in the loop with some of the newer music. Cause I'm really behind on what's current, especially in pop. Cause I don't really follow pop like that as much. Um, which is funny, by the way, a friend of mine and I, we went to the Tyler, the creator show, um, a few nights ago and it was so funny. I felt so old. <laughs> for the like I know I'm a little I'm getting up there but damn first of all I didn't know I didn't know two of the opening acts let me I gotta google these people I, I knew who Vince Staples was so Vince Staples performed but the crowd wasn't really feeling him like that um hold on let me see who these people were on this lineup because like I got a story for y'all real quick um nothing crazy just what I observed um what's the name of this show who's on here if I mess up these people's name I'm not bad um Anyway, so on the show, he had three opening acts. And dang, man, show the name of who the people are. I don't know. Um, <laughs> hold on. See ya. All right, let me see. Um, I got to find it. Got me cussing and treat. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, what are these people's names? I'm sorry, y'all. This wasn't a part of my conversation, so I don't have my thing. Anyway, um, he had these three opening acts. And... Okay, here we go. Let me type it in. Open an act. Duh. Okay, so there was Vince Staples, and you know he was—he's from Long Beach. So I kind of rock with some of his music. The kids, mind you, the whole crowd in there is like fifteen. So I already feel like <clears throat> I already feel like I'm a senior citizen in there, and so <clears throat> I'm in there with all these high schools. And mind you, we've seen Tyler the Creator before. We saw him at the Pavilion in 2019 really great show right and even then that was a bunch of kids and that was a weird time because when the show ended it's like all these little 15 and 16 year olds they're out there trying to be adults and drink and stuff so when you were leaving you had to like step over because this was an outdoor venue you had to like step over piles of vomit and there were kids drunk and crying and the parents were trying to pick up the kids in the minivan i was like this is a lot maybe it's interesting but anyway so when i get there the opening acts um the first one, what are these freaking people's name, man? I'm like clicking every article and they want to show me everything but what I'm asking for. Here we go. <clears throat> so when I came in, some app called Tizo Touchdown. All right. No disrespect to what they had gone, but I was confused the whole time. And so <laughs> they were doing whatever they were doing. I mean, and, and the crowd was eating it up. They thought it was the greatest stuff ever. And I was just, I was so lost. I didn't understand what was happening. I was like, dang, I'm turning it to my parents. Oh, my God. No, no, no. So they get off the stage. And then that's when Vince Staples does his bit. I actually liked his piece, but the crowd was quiet for his set. And then they had this girl, pretty good music, um, Callie Uchis, I think. You would have thought that she was the second coming of, like, Beyonce mixed with Rihanna and Janet and Madonna and Tina and Diana and Whitney and Mariah and Shania and Tony and Faith Hill and Faith Evans. and Like, the way that these people in this arena scream for this woman. So I thought she was about to come out there and spin on her head and do some singing sing because I've never heard of her. I mean, I, I recognize her voice now because she's on I think that's her singing on Tyler's um I think song and so mind you the songs she performed were actually really nice songs I really enjoyed the production but she wasn't on that stage doing anything and I try not to be critical of folks but I was just like all right maybe I'm biased because I grew up in the era of Janet so when I see a certain kind of entertainer come on stage there's an expectation and so 
singing, she was doing a little nging nging and singing, but there wasn't a whole lot going on. She doesn't really dance, but when she would do a little simple shake, you know, she shake one hip, and then everybody in there would start passing out and foaming at the mouth. I was like, man, so much has changed amongst the generations. It's interesting what people are into. But anyway, Tyler had a really, really dope show, really great. Um, so I recommend you see a show if you feel safe going. I had my mask on in the concert the whole time. I wasn't playing no games with them kids. But plus with all that screaming they doing, nope. Anyway, um, but that was a really great show. Anyway, let's keep it going. I'm going to start winding down. I had a few more topics, but we've already covered a whole lot tonight. Um, let's see. Um, trying to find a good one here. Somebody said, "Who's gonna check Calvin?" It's not, even, <laughs> and it's not even me trying to be confrontational. Like I'm pretty level headed. I don't really be going in on people, but just don't come at me sideways. I don't be liking that mess, especially when I mean well. Like some people like to come on these platforms and be deceitful and deceive folks. That's not my nature. And if I ever get something wrong, I will always go back and correct it. So don't be coming on here coming at me sideways. I don't be liking that, especially if I'm doing a live after I came from work. Life in the OC said, yeah, why leave that sticker residue on your car? I think that's in response to the political bumper stickers. Yeah, I'm not messing up my car, putting no politician on there. And also recognize that when you do vote for a politician, it's not a marriage to them. You may have at that moment in time thought that what they were doing made sense and then they dropped the ball. I think sometimes we also tear down folks for who they vote for. It's, it's one thing to be irritated with somebody for what they vote for. But once there's foolery that continues and they keep endorsing the foolery, that's when you can have some smoke for somebody. All right. Anyway. Um, trolls jump into the chat and assume they know who black people feel, even if um, some are left leaning on some things. Cause I'm not, I'm pretty left leaning on a lot of things too. But I, you know, I just, <clears throat> yeah, I'm pretty much, yeah, I vote for what makes sense for me. I don't really have a lot of right wing views, but I do see things as they are. Um, and so there's that. <laughs> um. Hi, Calvin. Putin can't have the Baltic area. They are in NATO. And the thing about that is at one point they weren't in NATO. And what I'm saying is that's when things started to shift because there was a promise at one point in time that the Baltic region would not become a part of NATO. And it did in, you know, I want to say the 90s or some point like that. So, yeah, this is an ongoing kind of thing. Um, and that's why you have a place like Belarus, which is not a part of that, where they're, they're aligned with Russia because they didn't get sucked into NATO or they didn't choose to join NATO. So that's where we're at. Um, Yeah, but I listen, them Ukrainians ain't having it. They said, y'all ain't about to come up in here trying to take our stuff. They are giving Russia hell on earth on that one. And I think it sucks, though, because I think with politics, again, this is just a man with a big ego who wants to, you know, snatch up a country. Then who has to be collateral? The people. That's why I'm not a fan of war, because, again, the people are the ones who suffer. So even when you talk about Russia, a lot of the people in the country of Russia don't want a war. They don't want to go snatch up anything. But, you know, that's their leadership. And so, you know, you got to be collateral. And then at the same time, that's who y'all put in office 20, 30 years ago. And so here we are. Um, and the same thing with what's happening in the United States. A lot of the chaos that we're living under is a result of a lot of the people that we put in power over the last 30 years. You know, voting has its consequences um, in regards to what it is you, you vote for or what you support or what you continue to endorse and let continue to be reelected or stay in office for 30 and 40 and 50 years. And then they don't even do anything. Um, I just thought about this. We gave Ukraine 13.5 billion and our HBCUs only got 5 billion. And I think what sucks with that initially before it was determined that, that mansion and cinema weren't going to be doing anything in regards to pushing any real legislation, $30 billion was proposed for HBCUs. Like there was a goal to get it there. But again, Congress couldn't even agree on that. And look what happened. That was one of the first things that got chopped. And I think they cut it down to what, 15 or something like that. They started chopping it down because, again, they had to keep meeting in the middle because Manchin, this, this, this isn't the kind of law I want to do. I, I'm, not, I'm not voting for that. And uh, yeah, look at how go and look who's lining his pockets. Um, anyway, um, yes, tribal is hell in regards to politicians. Yes. That's a good line, too. Like they treat politics like a sports team. Teresa McFarland said, how does The Simpsons always predict everything going on? I, I don't know, but what made The Simpsons to me just, well, as a kid, I used to love it. I remember it came on every Sunday, 8 o'clock, 
And when I was little, when I still lived in Washington State on Q13 Fox, it came on at 7 p.m., two episodes back to back, the syndicated episodes came on right after MASH. But um, whatchamacallit, what would just be so funny is like the way that the show up until about um, the mid 90s, it just mirrored America. One of the funniest episodes to me is the one where I think Lisa Simpson, it was the tap dancing episode where she wanted to be the dancer, but she sucked at tap dancing. And so she was like, but I worked really hard, something, something, something. And the teacher was like, well, class, a lot of people, you know, do all kinds of things, but what do we call it if people get things that they don't deserve because they didn't work for it? And then the whole class yells out, communism. I was like, oh my gosh, if that's not like the American talking points during the late eighties and early nineties, like it, it, that crap had me rolling. Like as an adult, when I saw it years later, like, Great writing. Did I listen to the Nikki and Joe Budden interview? I have not, but I did see the snippet where she was talking about um, little Kim and her should have had a Vogue magazine cover. I saw that snippet, but I haven't seen the whole thing. Maverick Cruz said, oh no, the midterms are coming up. And I don't know what's happening with that. I'm nervous for the midterms and 2024. I don't think Joe or, yeah, I don't think Joe should run for re-election, but I don't know who's supposed to replace him because Kamala's not going to be able to carry an election by herself. And even if she were to run as president and somebody as her vice president, I still don't see the country pushing for it. it America is just not there. And I think the last eight years has shown us that. So I don't know what they're going to do for 2024, but we'll see when we get there. But for the sake of my blood pressure and my peace as of today, as for me in my house, I ain't thinking about it right now, at least just not tonight. But man, that's going to be a time. All right. Um. Um, somebody said gas was around 385 about a month ago and now it's 425 in Georgia right now. What gas, what are gas prices looking like where you're at? Um, dang it, my stupid car only takes premium. Um, for what I got to put the gas for me is like one, not one, <laughs> like 470. Um, yeah. Oh, and I was so mad today too, cause I had a meeting and it was like the very first meeting we had in person. They were like, Oh, virtual is not an option. I was like, y'all want to wait Till gas is five dollars a gallon to want to meet in person, talk about no virtual options. Okay, whatever. Um, M said, discovered your podcast on accident. Now I'm hooked. I fall asleep listening to them. My husband said, I talk in my sleep <laughs> while I'm listening to you. Don't laugh at me. I like doing a podcast, it's a lot of fun. The hardest thing is just keeping the stories because at some point I'm going to run out of stories to tell unless I start telling some of the later ones once I got older. But the, my favorite stories to tell are all the ones from when I'm like a kid, because it's kind of funny to kind of look back at how you saw the world and how you process things. I always tell people like comedy is not even about being funny. It's really just about how you interpret regular everyday situations. That's what makes it funny. So if you look at like a show like Abbott Elementary, what makes it funny is just it's regular, common, everyday situations, but how the characters respond is what makes it funny. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, there also is cold humor where you purposely just intentionally go out of your way to be funny. But a lot of times the funniest moments are moments where, you know, a person interprets or responds to something in their own way that's unique to their lens or their perspective. That's always hilarious. All right. This chat is way behind. This is still going off on the troll person. I'm good on that. We already addressed that conversation. Um, Chris Mann said, call me if you get lost with fire. That was the show. Yeah, that Tyler show was, I had a great time. Like, I don't go and see a lot of rappers because rappers are boring on stage to me. I feel like the only time you can really have fun with a rapper that only raps and doesn't do a whole lot is if you see them at a club. That's kind of something you do like when you're a little bit younger. I'm not really going to clubs like that anymore, especially for a rapper at this point in time. So like Tyler and only a handful of other rappers are the ones I'll go and see because Tyler will actually give a, a full show with like theatrics and a theme. And like he had like two stages and he had this boat that he hopped in the boat and the boat went across the arena to the second stage and like stuff like that I appreciate. There's effort where you let your music tell a story visually in addition to the fact that he's always had really great albums. So my friend got me on the Tyler a few years back. So thank you. I know you're watching probably. Um, let's see. Yep, somebody said rich folks make laws to stay wealthy. Exactly. That's why you, you notice the tax code hasn't changed back. We saw the tax code tax code change in 2017, and they tried to paint it as a tax cut for the middle class, which it wasn't. We just got the little $1,500 break, um, but wealthy people got a whole lot more, and then our taxes will keep going up until 2027. And they pass it off for us as if it was something that would help the middle class. And it didn't. It's kind of like even in this current administration where they keep trying to use the line where Joe keeps saying, oh, we took all of these children out of poverty because of the child tax credit. 
let me explain something. If you're giving people 300 a month, that is wonderful. But if all it takes is 300 a month to pull somebody out of poverty, then they're not really out of poverty. They're on the edge. They're still struggling, which is why I have a side eye for those in Congress who could not approve for that program to continue so that parents that are trying to make it to the end of the month would have support. Like our politicians are selfish and they go back into that same line about working hard. And that's literally the narrative they pushed out there as to why they would not push and continue that child tax credit. That helped a lot of families just be able to get on their feet. 300 doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot to some folks. But 300 also goes away really quickly. As soon as you go grocery shopping, that money is gone. So, you know, again, Flaws on both sides. One has a whole lot more, in my opinion, and it has a whole bunch of ill will behind it. But um, yeah, Alan Lewis said Kylie's debut album is good and her Spanish album has some nice songs. Yeah, like the music she had, I really enjoyed. Even like in her set, the last two songs I thought were really dope. But I, if I had a critique, it's just like you have to do something about the stage presence. Like even the dancers, I was like, who choreographed this? Like not to be rude, I was just like, okay. But I, I, from what I read, maybe I think they said she has a few confidence issues. But I mean, that seems to be the thing with a lot of the, the newer entertainers that are coming out. And I, again, that goes back to the conversation of the fact that artist development isn't a thing anymore. So the labels don't have it in their budget. So they kind of your 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 claim to fame at this point is pretty much just get some streams, get some numbers, get some popularity. And if you are popular enough, uh, you know, attempt to get a record deal. And, you know, if you get the deal, we're going to go ahead and just push what you already put out and put you on out there and go ahead and, you know, we'll have you maybe do a video at a really, really low budget. And we'll try to get you at one of these festivals. That's that's your A&R artist development at the moment, pretty much. Uh, they said his tickets were expensive. So I didn't pay for this ticket. So me, I got I got a few concert friends, but this concert friend, like, we always, if we go to a show, we always just take turns paying. So like, she and I saw, um, what do we see? We saw Erica. We saw Erica Badu, I think in September. And so I think I paid for those tickets. And then I think, yeah, we always just go back and forth. You know, that, that's what friends are for. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, let's see. Thank you, um, Sarah. She said, where can I get your shirt from? That shirt is oh, this one. I think I got this from Express like five years ago. Oh, look, I look like I got a chest for <clears throat> I'm about to be ready for the next cover. I got this from Express like three or four years ago. Um, so, yeah, that's where I got it from. Um, Nightcrawler886 said, as, Gen Z, as a Gen Z, the priority in performance has dwindled in favor of persons and aesthetic presentation. Um, Callie and Bodies that 60s Latina aesthetic with music references to the past. Okay, hold on, you got a second piece to that. Let me see if I can find your second comment because you put, that was smart that you put a one two. Um, there are still dancers and vocalists in this generation, but the style and, and personality is the emphasis now. Doja Cat um, being funny, Billie Eilish being goth-like and Callie having this pop soul vibe. For those who are seeing Billie Eilish, I'm probably not gonna see her. However, her opening act, Duckworth, gives a really good show. So if you're gonna see Billie Eilish, Make sure you make it to the opening act. I've been gassing up Duckworth for like two or three years now, but I think, and I think he, hopefully, God willing, his 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 career is gonna pick up because he makes really great music. Um, he's very musically inclined, gives a really great show. He's another one that will give you a very dynamic presentation. He's a really dope entertainer, um, so I really f with his music. Um, Essence Festival is back with Janet. Where's my email alert? Runs to Google. Yeah, I saw that she's opening. I, I don't know if I'm going to Essence because I feel like Janet's about to go on tour anyway. I think I'm going to just catch Janet here because it seems like she's about to tour because I know her and Charlie Wilson have that show in um, Ohio. I think it's in Cincinnati. So I'm stalling to see if Janet has a, a tour because I, I prefer to see Janet at her show's with her fans, because then I can enjoy the show amongst my collective of fellow Jacksonese Janet supporters. You know, when I saw her at Essence, it was cool, but like with Essence, and Essence is a lot of fun. It's a really great time, especially if they have a good lineup. 2018 was a dope lineup. They had so many people. It was um, it was like Teddy Riley had this whole new Jack swing set where he brought out all of these acts. So he brought out like SWV and Blackstreet and Keith Sweat and God, there's so many people I'm skipping. I think Dougie Fresh had come out. Um, there were so many people. And then there was, you know, Queen Latifah had her set, and she brought out all the female rappers. So she brought out, like, uh, Missy Elliott, and I think Yo-Yo, and Brandy had come out and did, did the I Want to Be Down remix. And there were all these different people that had come out, and, and I think Salt Pepper was there. Um, there was this really great neo-soul bit where it was um, The Roots, Anthony Hamilton, Erica Badu, Jill Scott, 
Uh, Kirk Franklin came out randomly in that portion. You, you had Janet, you had Fantasia, you had the Clark sisters, you had Snoop Dogg, you had Escape, you had, I'm skipping so many people. Um, who am I skipping? I'm skipping a lot of folks. You know, it's skipping my mind. But long story short, there were so many acts that year. It was a great time. But I enjoy seeing Janet at her actual shows because, mind you, the show I liked because it was, it was a show for her fans. But um, I think for a festival that year, maybe she might have should have just stuck to like the big hits that everybody knows because she did a lot of like album tracks that she never performed before. But I think it's it's funner to see like your favorite act in their element. But I might if Janet does not announce a tour by like. May, then I'll just go to Essence, I guess. We'll see. Plus, New Orleans is really fun. And I still want to go back to this place called, I think it's Appleines. They made the best freaking crab cake Benedict I've ever had. Um, or maybe it was lobster. I don't know. That thing was good. I, was, we, I ate two of them things. We went there two days in a row because the food was so good. All right. Um, Forrest Hinton said it was after the re-election of Boris um, that NATO started expanding eastward after Bill Clinton promised mm, that NATO wouldn't expand to the east. See, I know I wasn't crazy. Yeah, I remember that piece. Thank you for, for sharing that, uh, Forrest. Um, Javon said, and ain't no reparations. He, look, he, they, that's never in the platform. And that's why also, too, when it comes to the conversation around voting, in order to even get into a space where we can even really consider the fact that reparations will be taken seriously by those in power, you got to have enough people who are even willing to support it that are in power. And the fact that we got so many people that don't even want you to know your history, we, we they certainly won't be pushing for reparations because they want you to just shut up about the past. They want to sit here and pretend that America's always been a great place. And, you know, if the history doesn't highlight our founding fathers and Paul Revere on that stupid horse, then, you know, it can't. it's illegal. So here's where we're at. Um, and Jacqueline said, yes, Ukraine used to be a part of Russia. Yeah, they were also under that. And, you know, eventually they were pretty much that's pretty much what broke up the Soviet Union at that point. Once Ukraine left the Soviet Union, they shortly collapsed not too long afterward. You know, the people in Ukraine had voted and said they wanted to go a different route. Um, but here we are. Um, Caesar said, Biden will never have smoke for Manchin. He actually considers him a good friend. And this is why these politicians get on my nerves, because... If 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 we're friends now, I understand you're gonna have to have your constituents and, and the people that vote for you. But like, we're I just think you can't. I don't think you can really be friends in in politics when it's a power battle and, and a struggle for power. And to be honest, you know, in the event that somebody like a Joe Biden runs for re-election and loses, one of the main reasons why people will will have decided not to have voted for him for a second term will be, you know. There were a lot of things that were promised that have not come into fruition yet. Now, it is has only been a year and a half, but still, you know, there's a lot of things that have been promised that have already been taken off the table. Promise after promise after promise after promise. And some of that correlates indirectly to the decisions of people like Manchin, who would not support certain bills. Same with cinema and a few other folks. And so recognize, like, when these politicians do this whole we're friends thing, I'm just like, see, it's all a game. It's kind of like politics back in the 90s. And I'll say before, from Bush back. You know, when you had candidates from, from both sides or politicians from both sides that would beef and chew each other out on the floor and then go to lunch later. Everybody's on the hill eating wings. There used to be a spot where you had the 10 cent wings, all of them being there chewing. You know, you're not really seeing that now because now politics is crazy. You got like lunatics in there like Bobert and, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, who I don't know what their purpose is, but they are convinced that they are some bad G.I. Jane ready to fight kind of folks. And I'm like, y'all just haven't ran into the right person yet. But I'm going to let y'all keep thinking that people are intimidated by y'all because nobody is. All right. Um, this chat is so, oh, finally, I got to the bottom of the chat. For some reason, it's been really delayed tonight, but it's okay. Um, did I have anything else I want to cover? Nope. Good. All right, so we can wind down. Oh, let me, oh, so I told you I went to um, Richmond. Like I told you, my favorite store in Richmond, there's a used record store called Plan 9. Now, back when I lived in Washington State, I covered Jesse Smola in the very beginning, Chris F. So when this ends, just go right back to the replay. Um, told y'all, like, Plan 9 was always my favorite record store. Now, when I lived in Washington State, there was a store called Buzzers that I used to love. It was, like, right in downtown Tacoma, and they had the best deals. Like, probably a third of every, of all the CDs I owned came from Buzzers because they had everything. You know what I mean? And, like, man, so once I found Plan 9, every time I go to Richmond, I always run there. So let me go grab y'all what I got. I ain't get a whole bunch this time because I was, um, what should we call it, not on a budget, but this was the month that the rent was due. 
Uh, yeah, I didn't get a whole lot like last time. I just got like five or six. Y'all know I'm an old head, so I went and I grabbed all of the um, push them called. By the way, somebody was like, how come every time you get up, it's like weird. You just don't push the chair back and get out. But it's like I have the camera perfectly calibrated to sit in a certain space, so I can't really move the chair because then it's going to mess up the whole shot. So I got to squeeze between the chair and the mic. But anyway, um, let me see. See, this is their, um, ah, yeah, this is so it's in Carytown for those who live in Richmond. Most of y'all, if you're in Richmond, you know what I'm talking about. So I got me some throwbacks, right? So I got Morris Day. This is when he went solo, right? Boom. It's the Daydreaming album, right? Didn't really do that well, but it's still a decent album. I'm going to check it out later on. And then Emotions, Flowers. Now, this is the record that has a few gems on it because it has I Don't Want to Lose Your Love. Um, what else is on there? Um, but no, Flowers... I can't sing it because I've been talking all day, but it's the little dun 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 dun. But they're doing it in like falsetto. Um, but like really nice song. Go back and listen to the emotions, the song Flowers. That's a really smooth groove. I love that song. Like it's a nice and like it's nice. So that's a good one. Um, fifth dimension. Now, I'm not endorsing the use of illegal substances, but I will say. For those who choose to eat certain items that make may make you feel <laughs> a certain way, Fifth Dimension is that group for that. They, they are the soundtrack for that kind of activity. I'm not endorsing anything, but so I did buy their album. They, and I bought the album because they make really, I, it's their sound is so unique to what was happening. No, not shrooms. I ain't doing no shrooms. That crap would have you walking off. Nope, not, not I said the cat. But um, no, I love the instrumentation in their music. You know, they, oh God, man. And they have a lot of, oh, I want to pull up something real quick. They have such a unique sound for what was happening um, in like the 60s and 70s. Um, can I find it? I'll find it later for the second time. Gladys Knight and Pips, Imagination. This might be their best album. This is the one that got all the gems on it. So you got, you know, Midnight Train in Georgia, The Obvious. You know, I've got to use my imagination. You know, that's the good one too. Darkness all around me. And Gladys get the ground rocking out the sun. I love that one. Uh, best thing that ever happened to me. Like, all the good ones are on this one. Like this is this is a good listen here. Um, and I I just like Plan Nine because they you can get like the vintage vintage one. Like this is an actual vintage one. It's not a reissue. So you know this got all the scratches and got all the smells from 1970s still on it. It still smells like somebody's kitchen that got the beads hanging from the door window. Like that's my kind of listening. This was my father's favorite singer, Frida Payne. Right, this is the album that has Bring the Boys Home. A lot of people know Free to Pain for Band of Gold. You know, now that you're gone, do, do, all that's left is a band of gold. Really nice song. But this one is Bring the Boys Home. This is that song about like Vietnam. She's, you know what's weird? She still kind of looks like this, like today. She aged very well. Um, Oh, and Jeffrey Osborne, you know he sings down, right? So these are the ones I got. Um, This is the one that has the borderlines and the power on it. So those are just a few I got. I wanted to get a whole lot more, but I wasn't trying to get my lights turned out because rent was due. Um, so yeah, that's my music. I'm gonna have to start going through the records at the beginning of the video. But um, I didn't say glad. Oh, you said pimps, not pips. It's glad it's not in the pips. I mean, it's not pimps. <laughs> it's pips. Glad it's not in the pips. The pip, pip, no m. Pimps. <laughs> uh, all right. But no, Emotions is my group. They, they, you know, an album they had that was really good, too. Um, it didn't sell that well. It was the album after the album that had all the really, really big hits. It came out, I want to say, in 80. Um, it's the album that has I Should Be Dancing on it. The song didn't really do that well in the U U.S. It did okay over in Europe. Um, but there's a really great song in there called What's the Name of Your Love. That is a dope little, if you're doing like that Saturday, Sunday cleaning, you'll put that thing on and put that song on repeat about four times. It's a good little, um, listen, a uh, good listen. Let me see. Emotions. Um, let me see what the name of that album is. I always forget what it's called. Of course, they're going to show me Mar Mariah Carey. Yep. Yes, we know she had the bigger title of Emotions. But I'm talking about the group, not the song. Um that's a good Mariah album, by the way, too. I like that song, um, To Be Around You, off the Emotions album from, from Mariah. That's a good one. Um, it's not Sunbeam. Okay, Coming to Our World is the Emotions album I'm talking about. That was 1979. And so that's a really nice album. Um, also, rest in peace to remember that passed away. I think that was Pamela. All right. Anyway.
Chris Mann said, but after Cardi B, Sweetie, Lotto, City Girls, and never and even several one-dimensional rap girlies without lackluster bars and ghostwriters emerged and were able to throw. Oh, I think y'all are having like some um stand war, so I don't know what's happening, but okay. I missed the context of what was happening in that. So I'm gonna just let y'all carry that conversation. Um for said, wow, they're still open. Richmond native who hasn't been back in almost a decade. Yeah, it's in there and it's thriving. Every time I go in there, it's packed out. Um, and I'm stubborn because when I go, I start at that R&B soul section and I'm going to go through everyone until I get all the way to the end of the, uh, of the thing. And so anybody who's behind me, they're just going to have to wait. So you, if you're smart, if you see me here, you better go to one of the mother aisles and, and meet me once I get there. Because if you stand behind me, you're going to be waiting for like an hour because I'm going to look through every record. All right. Said, bro, do you have a turntable? I do. Actually, this, this would be my third. I need to get a new one. But I remember my dad, my gift as a child, when I turned 12, my dad gave me two turntables and a mixer. Because there was a period in life where I thought I was going to be a DJ for like a week. And so he gave me some turntables. And then he also gave me his whole vinyl collection. And he has crates and crates and crates. But all the crates are at my mom's house. And then my stuff is at my mom's house, too. But um, So I need to get me a new um, turntable here, a record player here, but you know, I used to, and like, it was so cool. I wish I could, I can't share a picture of this. I got to start using the other, um, apps that allow you to like post pictures and stuff while you're doing a live. But my room when I was in high school, like my whole wall was all music equipment. And so, cause I had them throwback speakers that stack. So I had like the regular stereo system with the five disc changer and then the stereo systems that stack. And then I had like eight speakers, so, like two big speakers. And then I had some like medium sized ones and I had them all around the room. And then I had the mixer that was right there. I had the little lights. You couldn't tell me anything. Um, no, I never really did the DJ thing. I'd be a terrible DJ now, especially if I had to do like a, a current party because I don't know what pe folks are listening to like that. But if I was doing like a throwback party, we'd be cranking. Oh, thank you, um, Sheila Lori. Did we miss the Bel Air discussion? No, because I almost forgot. Bel Air. Okay, so people were asking me, what did I think about the show? I like the show. The only beef I have with the show is Carlton. I'm not going to spoil it, so don't worry. But if there was one character I want to fight every time I watch the show, it's Carlton. I, I like the way that the show is written because um, it's just a very different perspective. If you're watching it with the intent of thinking it's going to be anything remotely close to the sitcom Fresh Prince, it's, you're going to be disappointed. But I think if you just watch it to watch it, you'll actually enjoy it, especially as it gets deeper. I think my favorite character on the show is Aunt Viv. Plus, that is one gorgeous actress. Like, I ain't trying to say much, but she's booking all the women on the show. Like, she... She, you, you know how like on the sitcom, Hillary was like the glamorous, beautiful one. Aunt Viv is the one with the, the that's catching everybody's eye on this show. She is gorgeous. Good for her. Um, but no, it's it's really good. I like it. I'm two episodes behind so far, but I've wanted to fight Carlton the whole show. I ain't ever been so frustrated since Tariq on Power back in the day. I, there's no one else I wanted to fight any more than Tariq, but Carlton has taken that crown. Carlton be stressing me out. Like, man. Because, again, that conversation of black faces and high spaces, Carlton is that, the whole show. Where did this? Man, mm, he be on some BS. Anyway. Um, somebody said, oh, my God, I envy your childhood room. No, you don't, because I wasn't allowed to go nowhere. That's why I was always in my room. My parents were like, no parties, no nothing, stay in the house, be in the house by 10. I'm like a junior and senior in high school. Curfew was like 1030. It got to like 11 towards the end. but And it would be so bad, because sometimes when I used to hang with my friend Antoine back in the day, he had a car, and I didn't have a car yet. So I, Or when I did have my car, I wasn't allowed to drive until I was a senior. Um, so he was my ride everywhere. But I knew if I went with Antoine, there was going to be a strong possibility we weren't coming home on time. And I'd always get in trouble because he'd be dropping me off at one or two in the morning. I'm like, man, I'm about to get killed. And I remember this one time. <laughs> Actually, let me tell you how small the world is. Um, so a lot of you guys might know like the Kev on stage guy um, on like social media. He's like a really funny comedian. And then he has the wife that has the podcast. So back in the day, like his sister-in-law and I are both from Washington State. We all went to the same high school. And so back in the day, I remember we used to always go to Mel's house all the time and hang out. And Antoine, you know, we, I'd be like, all right, Antoine, like, it's, it's like 12, 30. I was supposed to be home an hour ago. And there was this period where my dad's job had him in Alaska. So it was just my mom there. So that's when I was really showing my behind because I could get away with a little bit more. But I still knew not to try my mom because my mom can fight. And so 
That's why Antoine, like, yeah, I got to go, man. We got, oh, man, you, man, I'm not leaving yet. Because also, Mel did not live that close. Like, they lived, like, in, like, South Hill towards almost Puyallup. I was in Spanaway. Um, and I think by then, Antoine had moved, I think, to Tacoma or something. But, um, man, I remember we'd always hang out at their house because they had a dog or something like that. Antoine always, like, playing with everybody's dog or something like that. And I think at the time, um, I want to say somebody in that family had just had a baby. I don't know if that's one of Kevin on stage's kids or somebody else. But anyway, um, so he'd want to stay with the, and hang with the dog and play with the kids and everything. And I'd be stressed out because my mom has blown my phone up like 80 times. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm dead. I'm dead. So finally, he started taking me home. And then, you know, my mom, hey, mom, I'm almost home. I'm almost home. I'm almost home. And so she called like every five minutes. I'm almost home. Mom, we, we, we turn in the corner. We're on Pacific Avenue. And then, like, I just remember this one time. I was two minutes from the house. Like, and when we still live in Spanaway, once you got past Walmart, that was technically home. And I was like, my mom called, hey, mom, I'm at Walt. And you just heard the phone go, click. I'm like, damn, I'm dead when I get in this house. I am dead. I got to the house. My mom was at the stairs waiting for me. I was like, dang, <laughs> what a time. My parents were very protective. They were very nervous about me being out too much because they just, no, they were not having it. Even when I got in the house, they were so scared about me moving to D.C., they were like, well, you sure you don't want to just go to school here? Mm -mm, no, I, I want to go to D.C. And so my mom used to send me every article about whatever murder happened that day. Somebody got acid thrown in their face. You know, I had a cousin actually get killed in the Metro in the 80s um, in the Metro. I don't know what the story is behind it, but when they found him, like somebody must have poured acid and his entire like everything inside the skull had like been burned out and liquefied onto the platform. This was in the 80s. Um, so ever since then, my mom always had like a certain perspective of the city. So she was sending me every article that happened. And remember like 05, 06, DC, DC still had a lot of murders at the time. So she was stressed. I remember when I started Howard, she called every day, like four or five times. What are you doing? Where you at? And she would look at my bank account to kind of measure where I was going. And what are you doing? Why were you all the way at Chipotle? Cause that's what she called Chipotle. Why are you at a Chipotle in Baltimore? What are you doing over in Baltimore? Your classes are in DC. I'm like, oh, what a time. Man, anyway, I want to be a teenager again. Cat BX said, me too, Calvin, strict mother. And now my mom is like the coolest person ever. Like she has gotten her Stella, got her groove back, you know, renaissance makeover, reapproach to life. You know, she's gotten engaged. She goes to concerts and I was like, well, you weren't doing none of this when I was a teenager. We we would have been all right then, but that's okay. Yo, she she's cooking special exquisite meals now. She still cooked for us, but like, you know, because she's engaged. So I guess when you, you fall in love again, you you just so I mean she called me and told me about a special lemonade she made. I was like, you ain't never made us no lemonade growing up. I remember this one time back in Washington State, my favorite restaurant was this place called Claim Jumpers. It was in South Center, like right by South Center Mall. They had this seven layer chocolate cake I used to love. Anyway, my mom and my dad, they went out to eat and didn't take me and Marcus. And, um, you know, but they didn't, they also didn't cook that day. So we were like, where's mom and dad? Because they never came home from work. And it's like nine o'clock. And then they finally come home because they were ignoring our phone calls and everything. You know, I'd have made some noodles <laughs> or something. My mom and dad come back with these bags. And I'm like, oh, they went to Claim Jumpers. Like, we're thinking they got us something. Got us nothing. I was like, Mom, what the heck? Y'all want the claim jumpers? And my mom was like, Man, your daddy needed us some time. Da, 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 da. You know, God rest his soul. And she was like, You know, go on in the refrigerator and cut you some lasagna because she made some lasagna like three days earlier. It's like, Mom, and my job, I don't even eat cheese. I was like, See how y'all be doing? That's why I'm still skinny now. I wasn't fat enough as a child. <laughs> anyway, let me quit playing. And Chipotle's nasty. I don't need it anymore, but it was a thing when I was in college. You know, when you're young, you can eat any and everything. But after like 26, 27, Stuff don't agree with you. Uh, it just don't agree anymore. I prefer to eat um, kava if I got to do anything remotely close to um, Chipotle. I haven't had them in years. Um, let's see. We're going to wind down. It's pretty much everything. All right. You should check out Jeff Buckley. He's, um, he took rock vocalist to a whole nother level during an alternative rock scene. Um, son of Tim Buckley and can sing in five octaves. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to actually check that out because I do listen to rock music. We be jamming. I did grow up in Spanaway, so fortunately I got to listen to everything because when you went to the school dance, that's what they were playing was a bunch of rock and country. And every now and then you get the hip hop song. So um, let me see. What's his name? Jeff Buckley. All right. I appreciate you for that. Thank you. All right. Let's keep it moving. Um... He's a huge figure in folk music, if anybody. Okay.
Somebody said, what? Oh, crap, my chat's all done. We're winding down, so um, I'm probably not talking about anything else serious, y'all, so we're just chopping it up at this point until I nod off. Um, crap, my chat is always jumping. Um, here we go. All right, you said the world is small, bro. You said the world is small unless you're trying to swim across the ocean. Yeah, we, 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 mm -mm. I was randomly watching. I don't remember what show it was. I don't know if it was Dateline or something, but there was an episode about this um ferry that sunk in indonesia and how like a lot of this was in the 90s um but like a whole lot of the people sadly died because something happened with the ship and so they were on the ship trying to pray and stuff but then they started fighting while they were praying about the ship not sinking so most of the people died but there was this woman who knew how to swim because a lot of the people sadly didn't know how to swim so they drowned and there weren't enough um life vests on the boat and the woman had to swim all because you know indonesia is like a freaking million islands she had to swim to like an island for like eight hours or something like that before she could get to you know so get rescued and how like her arms by the time she landed she could like barely move them and i was like dang people go through so much sometimes anyway um Truth be told, said, yeah, I love Kevin on stage. Yeah, he's a really cool guy. I don't really know him personally like that. We've been in the same room a lot of times, but we, we've we never known each other. And back in the day, especially when I still did comedy, there was a, um, in Tacoma, they had this thing called like Nate Jackson's Super Funny Comedy Show. I don't know if they still do it, um, but he used to perform there. And this is like 2010-ish, kind of. So yeah, he and I don't really know each other, but me and the sister-in-law are good friends. And I think his wife might maybe remember me, but we'll, we'll see. Maybe I need to make that Washington State connection. Um, Anyway, oh, another cool thing we're doing in my family, we've been tracing our lineage. My cousin Tiffany, if you guys remember, she's the one that when we, I think we did like a Christmas live a year or two ago, and she was the one that did all the singing. Um, yeah, so she's kind of taking it amongst herself to kind of go and get the lineage. So far, we can go back to 1892, which is pretty cool. But I've, I've been learning so much about my mom's side. Like the main thing is that they're Gullah Geechee, but somehow there's been some kind of disconnect. And so I don't know what happened in the middle, but yeah, I, that's what all my people were were at the time. I don't know. There's some kind of situations about a disconnect and folks being cut off and stuff around the 1910s or 1920s, but it's been a really interesting dynamic. So, because all I could ever do was trace back to my great grandfather. That's who I'm named after. That's where the Calvin comes from. But now we're able to get at least their parents, which is kind of cool. We don't have the birth years and stuff for their parents, but if my great grandfather Calvin was born in 1892, then it's highly likely that his parents were either born during the end of slavery or, you know, their parents would have been slavery or been enslaved. So, you know, it's interesting. So hopefully we can get a little bit further. It's so hard because the records are all over the place. And then the last names kept changing. And there's some people in our family who have an S at the end of their last name and others who don't just because some relatives back then didn't know how to read and the documents got all mixed up. Then there's a conversation about land that was taken from the government by us because again, that conversation of Bears land, a certain relative didn't really understand what was happening and thought they just sold their specific plot of land. And they actually sold all of it because again, Ayers land is not recognized by the federal government. Um, and so, as far as like people having their own plots, you can't do it. Heirs land can only exist as heirs land. So you can't do anything that affects commerce. You can't open a business. You don't qualify for FEMA if a hurricane comes and blows the house over. Everything has to be as is and you have to self-fund it. And so that relative sold what they thought was their plot and they ended up selling the whole bit. And now a lot of that is like Hilton Head and golf courses and there's all kinds of stories. So I can't wait to really dig and figure out the rest of what happened back then. Um, but there's some very interesting stories on that side. And that's just one end. So that's kind of cool. Um, let's see. Somebody said, I never ate at Chipotle. I don't think you're missing anything. Um, Tamika said, would you ever do the African ancestry test? My coworker was telling me I should really do it. I was like, I was thinking about doing it. I know folks are like, oh, but they're going to sell your DNA and everything. I ain't got nothing anyway. I mean... Yeah, I mean, I guess. I don't think you're gonna there's anything special in me where you're gonna be able to do a Henrietta Lax or anything. So I might do it. I just kind of want to see where I can trace everything. So that'd be kind of cool. Low country, yes, Javon D. That's exactly where most of my mom's side is from. Some so there's a lot in like Beaufort, South Carolina, Richland, South Carolina, and then there's of course Savannah, Georgia, which is like where everybody is. But we also had people that were in New York at one point in time. And so we're trying to figure out the connection with that side. Um, and then, like, my grandfather, who we thought was my grandfather, had 13 brothers and sisters. Um, and there's a we've lost contact with that entire site. So there's so many people that, man, it's so 
huh, so much happens to us collectively in regards to like slavery and sharecropping and stuff and everything just gets all mixed up. But what, what, whatever. Um, we're going to wind down because I'm almost done here. Um, somebody said the Geechee language is slowly being lost too. And see, look, I don't even know none of it because ain't nobody in my family know it. We, we done got cut off from that side. So ain't no Geechee nothing we know. All we got is just the, um, <laughs> that's it. But somebody said, what's the method or, that we're using? So because my cousin, um, she was an Eastern star and then all of the men on my mom's side were Masons. There's documentation about when they had signed on or when they had been, hold on, let me read my notes that she told me because I'm gonna have all this wrong because I don't be, I don't know anything about Masonry. Um, when they had their, what is this thing called? Um, come on, come on, my bad, my bad. Okay, the, the raising, they have a raising. So like the things like the raising that take place, and I think that's just pretty much when you get in, all of that is documented and um, you know written down. And so that's what's been able to help us go further back. And then I learned like my grandmother is in the Savannah um, History Museum. There's a picture, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm gonna go next time I'm in Savannah at the time where everybody was dying from TB because a lot of like my grandmother's mother and my grandmother's aunt died from TB back in the day. So my grandmother's mother died when she was four um, on my mom's side, but there's a picture of her getting her TB shot. Um, and it's in the museum. So there's so many cool little things that, I, my family, we're all trying to piece together. So that's going to be really cool. And apparently I already knew I had relatives in DC, but that was my father's side. But now we've learned, I have a whole bunch of family on the mom's side that is here too. So there's no telling. I've probably been chopping it up and partying with folks and we was cousins the whole time. So, all right. Anyway, This has been really good, y'all. I had a lot of fun on this live. Um, somebody said they don't sell your DNA. I don't know what they do. I just kept seeing everybody ranting about stuff. I was like, well, okay, I guess. But um, let's see. He said, I think people worry about their DNA being sold because the company makes profit off of you. Ah, okay. Um, Ramya, hey, that sounds about right. Yeah, Melody said African Ancestry doesn't sell your DNA. I used them and it was a really good experience. I kind of want to do it because our families are so scattered and separated. I would love to do that. And then again, I don't know a lot of my dad's side in regards to my grandfather's people because I wasn't raised with them. I didn't meet him until I was nine. Um, and so by the time I was old enough to build a relationship with my grandfather, a lot of that side has passed on. So he's my last living grandparent on my dad's side. Um, and there's so much I don't know about that side. Now, I've, I've done those wonderful conversations where you just put the thing on record and he starts talking about who his parents were and all that. Um, but yeah, I just, I want to be able to kind of center everything. Um, that even like knowing your family is a freaking privilege. Some people, especially in other countries can trace their families back hundreds of years. We only can go back about three generations. <laughs> all right. All right. We are winding down. Let's see. Oh, look, I can show y'all a picture of my uh, great-grandfather because she had a picture, which is kind of cool. Let me show y'all the original Calvin. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Now, don't y'all be in here trying to dig up my identity and stuff and be trying to steal stuff. Then I got to fight y'all on, on site for real. But let me see. Um, what's her email? If I can find it. Oh, and I have my great-grandma's picture in here. Cool. Um, where are you at, woman? I got to find the email. Hold on. All right, here we go. So... This would have been the great grandfather that was born in 1892. Um, this would have, damn, it's too bright. This would have been, this is the Calvin that, um, boom, that's, that's who I'm named after. And then this would have been him at his raising I was telling you guys about back in the day. I think this is in the 1910s. Um, and then this is, I have it. Oh, I got to see where I found it at. Um, this would have been the great grandmother that passed um, when my grandma was four. This isn't really like a real photo. This looks like it's a painting almost. Um, but let's see. I don't know if you guys can see this. This would have been the great grandmother but she she died when my grandma was four so 
that kind of closed the door to my grandma knowing her aunts and stuff like that as a child because she ended up being um, raised by a family friend. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of time stuff going on. So that's kind of cool. Um, and folks kind of, you'd be trying to see who looks like who and, and everything. So that's kind of dope. Because uh, I, I have never seen any of these until maybe a week or two ago, which is really cool. Um, do I have anything else I was going to share with y'all? I think I have the one of my, let's see. Um, I don't know if I have it. Um, come on, come on, come on, come on. I don't think I got it. It's okay. Um, oh, no, I sent it to my brother. Hold on. Let's see. Here we go. All right. This would have been my great grandma and her sister, but both of them died from TB. So the sister lived in New York and caught TB and then came down to um, Savannah with the great grandma. And then she had, I actually know I'm saying it wrong. I think, am I saying, I think this is the great grandma and her daughter. The, the daughter is my grandma's sister. So the daughter lived in New York and caught TB, came down to Savannah for my great grandma to take care of her, but they both ended up dying from it. Um, when my grandma was four. So I forgot who's who. I think this is Jenny and I don't remember the other lady's name. I got to look at the paperwork. But And they look just alike to me. And it's funny because, you know, back then the pictures took a little bit longer to take. So people didn't really smile because they had attitude because you had to sit there for like 10 minutes for the picture to mature. So you, you know, you picture your wedding day. All right, y'all take y'all wedding pictures. 1905. Look happy. Hold it for the next 10 minutes. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> but anyway, um, all right, we're going to wind down soon. Let me set this clock because I'll be saying we're going to wind down and be another hour. And we've already been on here for two hours and 48 minutes. All right. Thank goodness tomorrow's my Friday. Well, I guess everybody's Friday. All right. I'm going to set the clock to 1210. It's 12.06? Dang, y'all got me up here late. Okay, we'll go to 1210. See how y'all be having me up here late and then I be at work all tired and then I ain't got no energy for the kids. All right. All right, so we got four minutes. Um, Chris said, my great-great-grandpa was Thomas Edison. Okay. Um, F.E. Gray said, 23andMe does sell your DNA, which they use for linking crime. Oh, wait, I might want to rob a bank or two. Let me think about this. Each company is different. I would suggest each person take the time to do their own research and select the company that best aligns. Yeah, I might want to do some crime soon, so I don't know if I need to know having my DNA. <laughs> All right. Um, um, Kira 34 said, damn, I can't go past 1910. We were Afro-Caribbean. Yeah, it's... It's hard because so, so, so many of the records are lost or, or were destroyed or weren't really taken down, especially when they were doing all kind of shenanigans in regards to transferring people around and stuff. And with that sharecropping, and then uh, people's last names were changing and stuff wasn't done on record. It was just through hearsay. And now your last name was this. Like my mom was telling me when she went and joined the army, she didn't even know her last name wasn't really her last name. She thought it was one thing and the military told her that wasn't her last name. So she had to go and get her birth certificate. I forgot what, what the phrase is, but they had to go and redo some stuff because information wasn't right. She grew up the whole time thinking one thing. It's like, okay. Um, I say, Calvin, when you getting married, I don't need a big ceremony. Don't block me. <laughs> My mom was like, hurry up. You need to hurry up. You take it too long. I'm like, leave me alone. Because first of all, my parents got married. My daddy married my mom at like 32. So like, y'all don't be rushing me. <laughs> I am enjoying bachelorhood. All right. Um. Oh, that is such a good point. Please check with your local library. They will have resources for tracing ancestry with um, access to many databases that helps. That's helpful, especially when you talk about people who like borrowed it in got books and stuff in the past too. A lot of those libraries archive, you know, those records on top of that. So yeah. And then a lot, I think the libraries often also have a lot of the census records and stuff too. Um, Cause that's the other thing that's kind of cool. Um, my cousin was able to find a lot of the census records. Um, and so in like the doc, cause she just got, has like a whole one drive with all the good stuff in it. She has like the actual census records um, from 1910. Look at everybody's handwriting. Like when census was, you know, it was by hand. Look at this. Like, I don't even know how to read none of this. This is like that doctor handwriting. But look at how everybody used to write back then. So um, that's cool. Um, and then what else is this? 
And then like bank records, what year is this? This is, oh, it doesn't have the year. Mm, I don't know, but all right, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, I wish I could write better. I have horrible handwriting, so my handwriting is trash. If y'all have seen mine, like I, I got horrible handwriting. All right, so this was really, really cool, guys. Um, I'll probably probably try to get one more video in, God willing. Um, I'm just trying to play catch up. I'm so behind on so many things. I had a real, like I said, I had a really eventful three weeks, and there was a whole lot going on, and I have a whole lot of things I'm working on at the same time, so it makes it harder. But, you know, we will get something out there. That's why I like doing the lives, because we can just chop it up for, like, a good – um, you know, two or three hours. It's funny because the lives initially, when I first started them, I was like, oh, they're just going to be like 45 minutes and we'll get off. And then it was like, oh, now it's an hour and a half. Then it was two hours and then it was three hours. So, you know, here we are. Um, um, Ramia A said, I think from what I remember, a lot of people were also taught writing lessons back then, not writing as in being literate, but calligraphy and stuff. You know, we had to take drafting too. I mean, in middle school, I mean, in addition, you already knew cursive by fourth grade, but we had to do, learn the drafting, how to like write extremely like precise in regards to if you ever decided to go on architecture and stuff. We had to learn how to draft in middle school, which is kind of cool. Um, and then they had an option for like the calligraphy, but I don't think I, I didn't even want to do that. Plus, again, my handwriting is trash, so I wasn't about to be stressing out. Dip it in the I don't have that kind of patience. But anyway, um, you guys stay safe. Have a great weekend. Um, and if I don't see you before then, you'll definitely see me next week. And, um, yeah, I'm excited about some of the things we're working on. Um, I've got some new ideas for the channel that hopefully y'all like. If not, that's okay. We'll always do something different. All right. Anyway, I'm out. Stay safe. Um, that's all I got for you. So, all right. We'll see you. Good night.